I, I like to jokingly say that like the antler restriction is the sta- is the state's acknowledgement that we're all too stupid to age deer on the, <laughs> on, the on the hoof. So at well, least we can count number of points. Yeah. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grow really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back, it's going to be a great looking food plot. For anybody that's looking to try deer grow, if you use the code HUNTER15, that's H-U-N-T-R-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com, and save 15% on any of your deer grow products. It's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself. Better food plots, bigger deer. And we're back. Hey, on our podcast, episode 163, as Nick continues to keep us in line. I'm so excited for this one. <laughs> this is uh, so. This is dropping the day after Christmas, right, Nick? Is it the 26th? Merry Christmas, Merry Chrysler. Yeah, Merry Chrysler. Uh, this one will be kind of a Christmas present, especially to the Pennsylvania deer hunters. Yeah. And as we're getting ready to open that present, I'll because I missed my thing here. I'll say thank you guys for listening. Uh, wherever you're at, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, take a minute, pause it, uh, give us a follow or a subscribe if you don't mind. Uh, like our stuff, engage with it. We do read as much as we can. We we try to keep up with you guys. Um, you know, it's it's tough sometimes, but we do appreciate you listening and thank you for being here. And with that, we've got a really cool guest today. So I'll, I'll kind of preface it with. Um the Pennsylvania has changed a lot in deer hunting over the last 20 years. And I think anybody that's been around it or been involved with it probably knows the name Gary Alton. Uh, Gary being one of those foundational people that, that made the change, the, the guy that made the change in Pennsylvania. And date myself, I was in high school when Gary uh, introduced a lot of these new thoughts about antler restrictions and concurrent buck doe seasons um, and held, uh, and I'll let Gary tell you the number. When was this? So you were in high school? Uh, two, right around 2000, 2001 time frame. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So, I remember it being in my lifetime. Yep. I mean, it's not like, yeah. Yeah. You were born. Right. <laughs> right. Right. I wasn't, uh. <laughs> really well, dates me. He's like, was I born yet? Well, yeah. You were born. Well, cause I didn't know, like if, if you would ask me when the antler restriction is, I, I was, I'm pretty sure you I was. You probably weren't of hunting age at that time. No, I was born in 93. So I'd have been what? Eight. Yeah. Eight, nine, something like that. Yeah. Um, so I was in high school. I was sophomore, junior high school, senior high school. Cause Gary will tell us he, he had multiple conversations, uh, over a course of years for, for these changes across this entire state. Um, at that time as being a high school kid, I didn't know, I had no idea what I was going to go to college for. Literally going to Gary's talks was probably one of the more influential reasons why I went down the wildlife path. Cause I was like, Oh wow. Like here's a guy who's literally having landscape level changes to Pennsylvania, of which I love to hunt. And so I was like, that sounds wow. good. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so it it was neat to kind of go to, I, I Gary and I talked on the phone for a while. I went to three of his um, kind of open house meetings, basically. Uh, and it was- That's a big deal for you, huh? It yeah, was, Ga- yeah. Gary's like kind of shaped a lot of your future. Yeah. yeah. That's I mean, pretty cool. A very, well, and so we'll get into the discussion with Gary, but what was neat about it is and even in today's we talked about this a little bit like you don't really know who the deer biologists are for states Mm. like most state agencies it's kind of a maybe you know the name or something but you don't see them you don't talk to them like they're kind of behind the veil right this guy made himself very public to a lot of people over and over and over again Mm. um and you know it it caused uh probably one of the biggest stirs or, or discussions in the state 
yeah. maybe history. Well, so for as much as we talk right now about like, you know, some issues that we're experiencing in other states, it's, you know, Pennsylvania is, is not one of them. You know, frankly, just because of our goals and missions, and I shouldn't say this because you do hunt Pennsylvania mm-hmm. a lot, but, you know, we, we find ourselves out of state qu- quite a bit. Yep. However, um, I think it's one of the few states that we look at and say, like, boy, it's gotten a lot better than lot it has better. while we're seeing a lot of these other states kind of going the opposite direction. Yep. And, I, you know, I'm sure he won't take 100 percent of the credit. There's, you know, there's other factors at play. But, like, mm-hmm. Gary had a lot to do with that. And the antler restriction that he put in, in place on the whitetail deer hunting season was probably one of the most highly protested things that any of us could like can remember in our lifetime. Yeah. You know, it'd be like man invading in Ohio, right? It's like, you better not. Yeah. And, but I think a lot of those people that contested it at the time are the guys now that are saying, you know, you know, Hey man, deer hunting Pennsylvania is as good as it ever has been. And we're all kind of looking around like, yeah, you're probably right. (laughs) Well, it kind of goes back to, you know, when Gary was doing all of these meetings, it's a great example of where the majority maybe wasn't right in how they thought. Um, Mm. And so, you know, big Mm. things, big changes happen sometimes when people go against the grain and maybe against the grain of what the majority was thinking. And so, you know, obviously, because we pretty today's guest is Dr. Gary All, um, which would be awesome to talk to Gary about, you know, what he went through, you know, what he saw through the progression to even his viewpoints today on like, you know, here's here's where we're at. You know, what do you think? Um, and I'm sure get plenty of thoughts on where other states are and other issues are in the hunting community, because I mean, you know, this guy lived through a lot of it in probably one of the, you know, premier whitetail states in the nation. Um, you know, from a tradition side, there was a million deer hunters in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the things that came from it and maybe guys my age or older would remember is, um, there was a guy named, uh, Bob Fry who wrote, we talked about like the trip, you know, how you used to have the Sunday trip. Yeah, so Bob, yeah. Bob used to write a lot for that. And Bob wrote a book called deer wars, which was basically, you know, documenting a lot of the things that were happening, uh, in this time. And it's a really cool book. Like if anybody has it or has it read it, I have it somewhere, but it's a really cool book to kind of, you know, get some of that inside look on like, and this was this was a serious serious time for a lot of deer hunters in Pennsylvania of of what was happening and the changes that were occurring. Pretty cool. Yeah. So without further ado, let's bring in Dr. Gary Alt. We appreciate you taking some time from uh, I guess sunny California, right? <laughs> yeah. Where so where are you now in in California? What part of the state? I live um, about thirty miles north of San Francisco. Okay, it's I'm in the country. It's in Western Marin County. Most of this area is uh, is not developed because for water quality, so they can have water for the urban areas. Yeah, quite rural where I'm at here, and I have uh, dogs. I walk every day, like four miles. Without I hardly see anybody when I'm doing it. I'm within a forty five minutes of two major airports, Oakland and San Francisco, so I can get in and out of here and I can settle in back in here where I feel like I'm in the country and yet I have access to get out if I need to travel. Very cool. Well, uh, Gary, Kenny, you heard our little prelude there and, and, uh, you know, obviously we, we didn't want to, you know, put you on the spot too much there, but it, it's an exciting podcast for Jared and I. I mean, we were super passionate about, you know, deer management, um, you know, deer hunting, obviously the tradition of hunting. Our families too. Like yeah. my, my dad, my, yeah. when my uncle heard we were going to be talking to you, he's like, are you serious? He's like, that's <laughs> the guy. He's like, ask him this, 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 and that. I'm like, oh, listen, I'll try. <laughs> I grew up in a family that way. I mean, everybody I knew, our, all our schools closed when rifle season started. Um, the best memories I have of my grandfather, my father, my son are being made now, mm-hmm. but I mean, uh, hunting was like the deer hunting, especially was really one of the most important things to me growing up and still is actually. So did you grow up in Pennsylvania, Gary? Yeah, I grew up in Northeast Pennsylvania. I was raised on a dairy farm up in Lackawanna County in the Poconos. Oh, very cool. So, I mean, yeah. you know, obviously then at your root, you knew the tradition of Pennsylvania deer hunting. Oh, did I ever? <laughs> yeah, I, was, <laughs> I mean, I was, I remember being seven years old with a double barrel um, cork gun sitting at the table with my grandfather and my father and all their friends, they were smoking cigars and pipes and stuff. And I was trying to be a man there with my little double barrel cork gun. And I just, you know, I always dreamed that when they went uh, to go hunting, I was just completely broken. But, you know, once I turned 12, I started to hunt and I killed a buck every year from the time I was 12, right on through until I was, I don't know, around 50 was the first time I didn't get one. I was uh, working for the game commission. I just started on the deer program. That's I had a few years where I didn't get 
a buck. I got some does and stuff, but um, so from I, twelve I to fifty, ice, so you shot a buck every year, Gary. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yep, yeah, for decades, I shot a buck every <laughs> single year. But like everybody else in Pennsylvania, you could take all of those racks and put them into a bushel <laughs> basket; they'd all fit yeah. <laughs> together yeah. in one bushel basket. Yeah, so well, I understood the hunters a lot, and uh, you know, once I uh, graduated from high school, I went to college for wildlife management. I met a guy who studied bears. And then he got me into an interview at Penn State where I actually was selected to do my graduate work on black bear research in Pennsylvania in 1974 through 77. And it was just really, really exciting. The early radio telemetry, anesthesia, all that was really new. So it was exciting. And I spent 25 years studying bears. I've done a lot of the original research, like on what do cubs look like at birth, you know, all the characteristics of cubs, movement patterns, how to adopt orphan cubs medical research we did we had a, one of the largest bear studies in north america like i've handled about three thousand bears myself anesthetized and uh hundreds and hundreds of den i mean i mean pulled hundreds of um mothers with cubs out of dens and all that sort of thing so even though i love deer hunting my profession was bears but in uh, 19 or in 2000 um there was a major controversy going on in Pennsylvania. That's how it led to the changing of antler restrictions. And the reason was um, the governor of Pennsylvania was under pressure because the state forest system was going to lose what's called the green certification of their forest. What that means is that, that the forests were no longer sustainable. They were not regenerating new trees. The reason was there were so many deer, they were defoliating it. And basically we were losing the forest. So the governor wanted to not have a green certification lost on their on his watch. And so um, he wanted to find somebody who would take on the hunting hunter situation and try to shrink the herd down so it was compatible with the forest. So it would be healthier for the deer, but certainly healthier for the forest, which would impact hundreds of species, not just deer. Right. And I had done a lot of television, radio, magazines, newspapers, everything. So he wanted me to take on the deer thing. I didn't want to do it because I figured it would end my career, which it did, you know, in due time. But um, uh, he was the person who really let us make the changes that were possible because it would have been impossible otherwise. We had he he really wanted this to work. He was a Tom Ridge was the governor. Yeah, he was really, really, really good, good man. Still is, and uh, I knew him because I took him and his family into the bear dens tagging cubs with them like five or six times. And so uh, when the new director said that, you know, the governor wanted to um, bring the steer herd under control and get the forest health regenerated, wanted to know if I wanted the job. And I said, I did not because it would probably end my career. Anyway, we went back and forth. And when I realized how serious the governor was about solving the problem, it, it gave me the opportunity that no one has had in the history of Pennsylvania. And that is, we would have the political immunity to really get aggressive and try and fix the problem because most people get scared and run. Yeah. When you, you know, you get a mad crowd and then they get their way. But in this case, we had a lot of good support and, and uh, we could dream our dreams and, and they gave us pretty much open, um, just really a typical amount of control over what was going to happen. Why did you think Gary, why were you worried that that would be like a career ending, uh, accepting that invitation? If the objective it happened to biologists before me for the last hundred years, okay. anybody who took it really, really serious, who wanted to make some substantive changes, got in big trouble politically. Any changes, major changes. If you really want to take on and get serious about shrinking that deer herd down to where they're not having enormous negative impact on the forest. You wouldn't last long, and that's because the simple right thing to do. Okay, mm -hmm. Gary. I was gonna say the simple, simple part of that is because hunters wanted to see deer, right? I mean, they they yeah. don't. Yeah, hunters measure the success or failure not on what they kill, but on what they see. Oh, I see. And they want to see a lot of deer. When you have the forest ecosystem evolving to where a lot of old agricultural land is converting to uh, forest, and during that stage, when you have a lot of young growth of forests. It's a lot of food. Yeah. And so then you can sustain much higher densities. You could have over, you know, 80 deer per square mile or so if you have really a lot of young growth around. But then it goes into pole stage timber and it goes down, oh, well, 10 or 15 is all you can hold. Right. But the mm -hmm. hunters, when they hunt somewhere where there is 80 deer per square mile, it's like it's like drugs. Once yeah. they have it, yeah. it's like deer cocaine. Once they've sniffed that, 
Yeah. That's all they want to do. They want to go where there's really high densities of deer. And as a manager of deer, if you can't produce 80 deer per square mile, then they they don't want to deal with it. And they sure as heck don't want to shoot does to shrink the population. They want more deer, not fewer. And you can talk to them until the cows come home, but it's really hard to get through on how to properly manage deer, that it's sustainable, the deer are healthy, forest ecosystem is healthy. That's in the hunter's best interest. It's in the deer's best interest. It's in everybody's best interest. Sure. But it's very, it's almost impossible in the state of Pennsylvania. It has been since the early 1900s, once the deer first recovered from their near extermination, uh, you know, in the late 1800s and very early 1900s. So uh, what happens going all the way back to the early 1900s, they closed down doe hunting. And there was a guy named Dr. Calibus, who was the pr executive director of the game commission at the time. And he was dead set against making it, uh, giving antlerless deer total protection because he said, once we shut this down, God help the person who tries to bring it back. They'll, right. they'll hang them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No truer words were spoken. And that was over 100 years ago. We've spent 100 years trying to work on that problem. But the unique situation in 2000 was that we had political immunity, essentially. We had people who were dead serious about making it happen. They were ready to take on a lot of um, incoming. And I had a lot of experience with the mass media and uh, with public speaking and so on. And I put together a team of people from uh, academia, hunters, also um, biologists inside the gang fishing and outside of the gang fishing, U.S. Forest Service and everything else. And we got those people together and the people I selected were the ones who I knew in their heart of hearts, they wanted this to work. Yeah. They were all hunters and they wanted to make sure that, you know, we were doing the right thing for the deer herd, but also they were doing the right thing for the forest ecosystem. And so that's hard. You know, once you get those people in a room, uh, all of them, and I trusted them. I knew them professionally, what they had done. I believed them. And we sat, we sat down and started to debate, you know, if you're going to make the perfect system, how would you do it? And then we would sit down. I was more in control of um, coordinating. I was running it, but um, I, a lot of other people on that team knew a lot more about deer than I did. I knew I knew more about bear than they did. But you know, I was a deer hunter. I was a biologist. I understood deer management and deer um, research, in, in, in basically, but I wasn't really the deer expert. But I didn't have to be because we had teams of people who were specialists in all different kinds of areas. My biggest job was politically to walk the walk. How can I go out and use mass media to um, win support, to make changes in policy that would be the right thing for the deer and the forest ecosystem? That's really the nut and bolt of what I had to do. So, Gary, so it was so exciting. So really Gary, exciting. one of the things that's interesting when you talk about that now in, in comparison to today is, you know, one of the biggest things that we keep hearing is, you know, we can't make changes. We're going to lose hunters. You know, first of all, we're already losing hunters. Um, yep. At that time, you know, here well, that you, is the concern. I mean, just like the concern you were addressing is the you know defoliation of a forest, the yeah. forest ecosystem. When we, you know, Jeremy and I try to point at issues we're having as hunters, it's the number one rebuttal is, well, we can't lose hunters. We're losing them already. We can't lose anymore. Our political yep. poll is it's going away. And I haven't heard you say that at all yet in this discussion in in what? the two thousand about you know what if we lose hunters? Well, there probably was no shortage of them, especially in Pennsylvania. We got more than any other state in the country. Well. Pennsylvania is, yeah, has the highest number, I think, of anybody in the state. Texas is right there, too. Um, Michigan is another big state for deer. Mm -hmm. But, yep. um, yeah, they're all declining. I mean, outdoor sports in general is declining. But in um, 2000, did it did it come up? Was it like, okay, hey, if we make these changes to help the forest, what's it going to do to the hunt, hunter numbers? Right. You know, um, I don't think there was a huge sweeping increase in the number of hunters or anything like that. Um, but it was the right thing to do. I think the the satisfaction of the hunters increased once we got larger bucks going. Undoubtedly. Sure. There were multiple pieces to that. The first piece was, you know, the most important piece was we have to balance the deer herd with the habitat. That means we're going to have to start shooting, you know, up to a half a million deer a year, you know, from 250 or 300,000 and really cranking it up on the analyst side. Well, that just... That drove the hunters crazy. Mm -hmm. But the point, but I, you couldn't, you couldn't really sell that by itself. They've heard that story for a hundred years, so they don't believe it. They don't want to. They don't want to know about it. You're right. But when you, what I said to them was, you know, I'd start off by saying, you know, I wasn't sent here by divine intervention. I'm not a, a giant genius, but a reason I took this job is because the greatest memories of my life 
are hunting deer with family and friends. And I, you know, that was like one of the most important things to me every year. And so I thought I would like to try. I'm not here. I'm not here to destroy what you guys believe in. I'm here to try and make it better. Now, we have to make you can't get from where we are, to where we need to be without making changes. And we're going to have to make a lot of changes. Some of them will be mistakes. I mean, it's inevitable. I can't sit here and tell you that I know exactly how everything's going to work. We have to test and see how it works mm -hmm. and keep making changes until we get what we need. But I hope, you know, I try to get trust from them saying, I'm trying to help all of us. And if we can't balance that deer with that habitat, you're in trouble too as a hunter because one, forest ecosystem becomes unhealthy. It can't raise deer anymore. And I don't care what you do. You're not going to find them when they can't grow there anymore. Yeah. Second of all, you know, we were the worst state in the United States at that time for shooting off the bucks before they grew up. Like 85% of the bucks we shot were yearlings of, you know, they would just left their mother six months before. Mm -hmm. So we had a very small number of two and a half year olds and three and a half year olds where you could, you could hunt a lifetime and never shoot a three and a half year old or older buck. <laughs> we were the worst example in the United States because we had so many hunters. We hit them so hard that hardly any of them survived. And you have got accessibility to most of that land. These guys have their, you know, their uh, tree stands and their huts put up and stuff like that. They, they just shoot them up. They're going to get 85% of them one way or another by the end of the second week mm -hmm. of buck season. And so I said, you know, I'm not, I wasn't, no one on the team ever dreamed that we'd have antler restrictions. There was no one on the team who wanted antler restrictions. When we started, okay. basically we wanted to bring the deer herd under control, but the same token, it was like the other thing that's a thorn in my side is we are the worst example in the United States on shooting these bucks off. That's not the right thing to do. Forget about the culture. You know, if you were here uh, on divine intervention and said, what would you do to make this right? You have to balance the deer herd with the habitat and we should do something about stopping this tradition of shooting every buck that moves you got to stop that why and why do you do it we all have you know i would get in front of the crowds it was nothing to have a thousand people i did 223 lectures to well over a hundred thousand people some nights 1400 people would show up and they weren't happy they were mad as hell <laughs> but if you talk to them from the bottom of your heart and just kind of puked it up you know they would say geez he's kind of wacky but you know he is a hunter and i you know some of this stuff makes sense yeah and so when we talked about uh, trying to find a way to slow down the buck kill, so what could we do? We could close buck season. It happened twice in the history of Pennsylvania. Both times, the people who proposed it and made it happen got fired immediately the next year. <laughs> and then they came back and shot all the bucks off the following year. Yeah, It's not sustainable. You can't, it's not a solution to this problem. You have to find a way of reducing the buck kill somehow. And so I said, okay, look, what could we do? Well, what about like Wisconsin, New Jersey, earn a buck? Make them shoot a doe before they can earn a buck. Mm -hmm. And politically, it was impossible in Pennsylvania. You could never get that off the ground in Pennsylvania. So I said, that's not going to work. Um, and so we started looking at all the different ways you could make it work and said, you know, what if we shorten the buck season? So 14 days now. But if you look at the history of a lot of these things, you don't want short hunting seasons because then weather dictates the outcome right. more than anything else. When you're trying to control a deer herd, you want to have a little longer and regulated so that you can get mm -hmm. your, your results. So weather doesn't impact you as much. And so anyway, we got looking at it. And finally, we looked and said, if we want to slow down buck kill, I think it has to be antler restrictions. And then and you look across the country, you see people are toying with it here and there. But I don't know of any of them who went out like we did. We looked at tens of thousands of bucks all over Pennsylvania during the hunting seasons. Our biologists and other people who are examining animals looked at tens of thousands of bucks, county, township, antler beam diameter, the width, the number of points on each side. So we had, we, we didn't know, like if you said, Hey, what's the average three-year-old have on her head over here? I don't know. Yeah. Nobody knows. Right. Hell you all almost never saw a three-year-old. <laughs> yeah. so, what's so, that? <laughs> you know, coming into this as a bear biologist, a lot of people said, what's he doing running this? He's a bear biologist. He doesn't know anything about deer, but so you have to kind of back down and explain things just to say, here's, Here's what we think is important. Here's what we want to do. We're looking for a way to let bucks live longer. And so we think now, after examining this, antler restrictions is the only way we could probably pull it off. Okay, what kind of antler restriction do you want to have? 
for a hundred years, we had uh, anything that had a uh, one antler that had uh, that was three inches long or longer was legal. And so you you killed off almost all the bucks in that kind of scenario. Yep. And so what are the other options? You could say, well, say you're going to stick with the number of points on a side. Then you go to a Y buck still. Lots of, you know, the, the most of the yearlings have spikes or Ys really mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania in the poorer habitats, which is most of the state. Not not like up with, where you guys are from in the southwest, Westmoreland County, yeah. southwest, up along the Ohio line where you have much bigger bucks. And so we said, well, what kind of antler restrictions should we have? What, what should we do? We had scientists like Dr. Dwayne Diefenbach from Penn State. We had team members from all over looking at this. And they said, well, we need to find out what we have, first of all, and then we'll figure out what kind of a restriction we need to do what we want to do. What do we want to do? We want to save at least 50% of the yearling bucks. How do you do that? You go out and you measure tens of thousands of bucks all over Pennsylvania and say, you know, if you have a spike system, how many do you protect? If you have a Y system, it has to have at least two points. What percent of those yearlings are protected? Mm -hmm. What if it's three points on a set? What if it's four points on a set? So you start looking at that on a really large scale. You're looking at tens of thousands of bucks, and you can see exactly how big these bucks are growing if they can stay alive. Right. It was shocking to me and a lot of other people because, yeah, we, were, we, had all, we all had baskets full of spikes and Ys. And you said, well, they just don't grow big in Pennsylvania. Yeah, if you... You know, if you shot bears when they were only a year and a half, the biggest bear you'd ever see would be 200 pounds. You'd never see a 400, 500 pound bear either. Right. So once we got to look at it and then we by looking at tens of thousands, you, then you started to get a small sample of bucks that were three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half. When you started to see those, you know, your eyes would fall, your head say, oh, my God, we can <laughs> grow big bucks. All we have to do is keep them alive. Yeah. Perfect. Antler restrictions. Let's try and keep them alive. We can't jump to this, you know system like that let's just not be the worst case in the united states what do we need to do okay we looked at it county by county in most of the counties if you go to just saying this buck has to have at least three points on one side one side or the other um that will save more than 50 percent of the yearling bucks so now you're going to get tens of thousands of yearlings are going to make it to two and a half at least right coming right out of the box first yeah. year so then you say all right um, but then they'll just shoot them the next year. That's what we thought was going to happen. We thought, you know, if we let them go and they don't shoot them, maybe 40, 50,000 bucks will get through that wouldn't have gotten through. And then um, they'll all shoot them all the following year. They're right. not going to make it to three, right. probably. That's what we we're thinking. We said, well, let's just try it and see what happens. And that was the most amazing thing. When we went to change to get antler restrictions, the hunters went crazy. Like, and they, they said things like, um, we are, we are we're gonna shoot first and count points later. I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And it happened every other night. Somebody would come up to the microphone and say, "We shoot first. We'll count points later." <laughs> I can't control myself. That's what they'd say. I can't control myself. And I would say, <laughs> maybe you heard me say this. I said, "What do you do when a Brinks truck pulls up to the bank? Do you just rob it?" Well, no. And I said, "You know, you bet. You have to learn how to control yourself." Because I said, there's a place for people who can't control themselves. It's called jail. Yeah, <laughs> not the with crowd, a weapon. The certainly, crowd just roared with laughter and stuff. You try and slow those guys down, but we literally thought they maybe they will shoot them and count later. Yeah. And when we launched, we we radio collared 553 bucks, and we monitored what happened, and they they didn't. We didn't see a lot of bucks showing up in, uh, that were dead on the ground, were having spikes and whys. It's a very small number of that happening at all. Well, then when we talked to the hunters and said, if we can let them live, they're going to grow bigger racks. And they said, we want to shoot them because if we don't shoot them, the coyotes will kill them this winter. They'll get hit by cars next year. And when they come back with these bigger racks next fall, the poachers are going to kill them before we can. That's exactly what they said. Night after night after night. And I said, that's what you think is going to happen. None of us know what's happened. We now have... 500 plus bucks radio card. We're going to know what happens. Right. So we got it passed through the board of commissioners by the thinnest of margins and every commissioner. I, I was there with them for almost 30 years. And I, obviously I was in the room. And when they took a vote on that, each commissioner stood up to the microphone and gave you know, just a, a plea to either against it or for it. And, at, and at, we only had seven commissioners at the time. There was one that was not on the, there was only seven commissioners at the time. We had to have four votes. 
at, at the one point at the end, we had three who were in favor. We had three who were opposed. Wow. The last vote would carry it. Oh, wow. I, I knew the commissioner, and I knew the commissioner, and I didn't think he'd have the courage to take on the kind of heat that he would get if he made that decision. Sure. And I looked over to the person next to me, and I said, it's done. I said, oh, my God, we're going to lose this by one vote. And that guy walked up to the pipe to the microphone and he said, you know, I know this is controversy, but by God, this is the right thing to do. And we're going to do it. They lost control of the meeting. The meeting went crazy because the people <laughs> in the room wanted antler restrictions it's really bad. Wow. So anyway, we got it through. But we were all the biologists on the team were saying, oh, my God, I wonder if they're going to shoot a lot of them and let them lay. That's not going to be good. It's not going not to make hunters look good if they're not following right. the rules. They did follow the rules. What did we learn? We learned that um, if you have whatever comes out the other end of the hunting season that gets through the hunting season. So if you have, say, you have 100 spikes and whys that get through the hunting season, what are you going to get? You know, what is your interest on that? What happens to that the mm -hmm. following year? Mm -hmm. Essentially, most of those are going to have eight points right. as two year olds. Yep. They're not big. They're basket rack bucks, 12 inches, 14 inches wide. But but remember, at that time, that was not common. That was really no, that was a big bad. buck. You paraded that buck around your town yes. if you killed yes. one of those. Yes. I I won. I won a number one position in 1966, the biggest buck that came into a, a, a into the pool. There were hundreds and hundreds of people in that pool. Mine was an, was an eight-point buck. It was 16 inches wide. It was probably either a nice two and a half. It was probably a nice two and a half year old is what it was, I think. Anyway, I won a new 30-30 Marlin. That was a monster wow. back then. <laughs> oh, that, oh, yeah. Everybody's like, oh, my God, look at the size of that. When we measured 50-some <laughs> thousand bucks or whatever it was, I forget the total number, and we saw how big, not how big they can get, how big the average was. Yeah. Well, then we picked up hundreds and hundreds of bucks all over road kills, and once we got the statistics on what – what we could expect the average buck to grow, then I got antler sets. You know, I had a little Y, so this is a typical yearling. And we've all seen hundreds yeah. of these. This is the typical two-year-old. I pick up an eight-point, 12, 13-inch spread. And then three-year-old, you're looking usually at an eight-point, sometimes 10 points. Now you're talking about 16 to 18 inches. Then when you go to four and older, bets are all off. You're going to yeah. see some really big bucks. And what I said to the people then, I remember I said, I'm not sitting here talking to you about – what happened in Texas in the early 1900s? I'm talking about Pennsylvania right now. You want to know how big they grow? Watch this. I held up the little Y buck and said, "Here, you know, here's your typical yearling." He said, "Look familiar?" Because you, you ought to. We all killed them all. Yeah. And then I'd say, "Here's the two-year-old." They're kind of nodding, and I said, "Look at it. when it really gets interesting is when they get to three and old." I pick up a three-year-old, and it's like, "Oh my god!" And then you show them four plus, and it's they said, and I said. I'm not guessing about whether these bucks in Pennsylvania will be this big. We measured hundreds of, we measured tens of thousands of, and I said, these is, this is not hypothetical. This is exactly what you can expect. This isn't how big they get. This is the average of what they are. I'm showing you a buck that's very close to the average dimensions of what we measured. We were shocked as well. And with that was like, that was like, <laughs> when the wow. hunters look at it as they're drooling, you know, I would I would raise my hands up and I'd show antlers on each side. I have a Y on one side and a, a big eight or a 10 on the other side. And I would say, which one do you want? You know, and yeah. they're like, <laughs> you know, they're like looking at, I said, does this look familiar? I said, you guys have them all over and everybody's nodding their head laughing. I said, here's what you can have if you can just keep them alive. If you will be careful, don't shoot them, let them live. We're not, it's not hypothetical. This is reality. This is possible. The whole thing's going to come down to you, whether you make that choice right or not. And I said, I, you know, I said, I know a lot of you are are worried about anti-hunters ending hunting. I'm not worried about that at all. I'm worried about hunters ending hunt, misbehaving, not following the rules. Those are the things you have to watch out for. And so we were, I was scared. I mean, when we went through, I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen? And when like Dwayne Diefenbach, his teams and our um, biologists, everybody were out there radio tracking hundreds of bucks. And when they saw what happened, they said, oh, my God, they're alive. They're still alive. And then the following years, you know, 40,000, 50,000, eight points show up. It's like, whoa. So really quickly, you start to say, whoa, this is quite a difference. But then, you know how we thought then they would just kill off them, kill them all off at two and a half, three and a half at the latest. What happened then was 
that's about the time when trail cameras got got really mm -hmm. uh, popular. Mm -hmm. And what happened? You guys know exactly how this works. You go out there and you set these trail cameras out, and you inevitably see something on the trail camera and say, "Wow." I've got a 10 point on my property with a 20 inch, 20 inch spread. Can you believe this? Now, all of a sudden, one of those two and a half year old eight points come out that's like 13 inches wide. Forget it. I'm not going to shoot pass them. You pass them. Yep. Yes, they're going to pass them. And, and they don't get those older ones as well as they get the younger ones. They're a lot smarter. They're a lot more nocturnal. They're a lot harder to kill. And so what? then you start getting this bleeding where they start lasting a little bit longer. Then the trail cameras start picking up more and more of those really nice bucks, you know, that score 120 or better. They, you know, they lived a lifetime and never saw a buck like that. When that happened, a lot of hunters really started backing off and said, I'm not interested in shooting. I don't care if it has six points. I don't care if it has eight points. I want something that's older, heavier, bigger. And it's, 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 I know it's possible because I have pictures of them on my own property. Yeah. That's what really did it. That was a few years after the restrictions went through and people started to look around and say, instead of putting on huge drives and trying to shoot every buck that moved, they said, you know, let's let those bucks live a little longer. Yeah. And now... It's unbelievable. It's, I mean, where I hunt, I, in the eighties and nineties and right up to now, I hunted in Northern Wayne County and it has really poor antlers in general. They have, they're known for not having very large antlers. When I was uh, there for several decades, you know, we all shot a bunch of deer, but when you put a drive on, you could have 40 deer come out and only two of them would be bucks and you'd right. be a Y and a spike. You know, it's like, it was frustrating in that same piece of land right now. We have over like 15 bucks that have eight or more points, you know, in, in like two square miles. And some of those bucks will score over 140. If we never saw anything like that before, it, it has gone. I never dreamed, none of us on the team ever believed anything like that would ever happen because we were just designing to not be the worst case in sure. the country. Once, once they started to see what was possible, they we, we created a new tradition. The old tradition is you shoot every buck that you see. They just exterminated them, basically. They were dead at the end of the season. 85% of them were dead. Now the new tradition is let them, let them grow up. We'll just shoot them as adults. I mean, not everybody's doing that, but it's enough is doing it where you get a lot, especially when you get a lot of adjacent landowners doing the same thing. Sure. You got adult bucks all over the place. It is exciting to hunt in those places. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen. And we've experienced personally over the past five, 10, you know, whatever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle. And, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us we trust the muddy and stealth cams you know together to be able to, to collect any of that information yeah i mean as an admitted trail cam addict you know i've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't yeah. matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually a mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. Say it all the time, man. It can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either muddy or stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep. Check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. Definitely. I think it's so wild because, you know, like I said, it, that was... I mean, it's the most significant change that the state had seen in so long. And oh, people people didn't quit hunting. They they kept hunting. Yeah. They, they didn't walk away from it. Well, yeah. it's it's so exciting to be able to hear that like people were making deer decisions, like amongst the hunting community, because it's like, from what I said earlier, like it just seems like we have to tiptoe so much because it's like, you know, you squabble one little bit, you make a comment about, you know, crossbows or something like this. It's like, we're going to lose it. We're going to lose hunting. The antis are coming for us. I think what you have to do, it's kind of like being a parent, I think. I think a good management is the same as being a good parent. And that is you have to be tough. You have to look at stuff. You have to ask the genuine question, what is the right thing to do? Don't be afraid to make the right decision. Yeah, you're going to get criticized for it. You have a little kid and you say, you know, um, if you eat your vegetables and your potatoes, you know, and, uh, and some meat, then you can have some ice cream for dinner. What do they hear? Blah, 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 ice yeah. cream for dinner. 
Yeah. If you don't stand behind that and you give them the ice cream, you let them, then you can't control. They're out of control. You can never control. It's right. the same way with the hunters. And so, you know, we kept looking at this and saying, we believe somebody has to stand up and say, what is the right thing to do? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I would stand there and say, I am an avid hunter. It's one of the most important things in my life. I'm an avid deer hunter in Pennsylvania. The right thing to do is to do what's right for the deer and to do what's right for the forest ecosystem. If you don't take care of that forest ecosystem, you can't raise deer. If you can't raise deer, then you can't, you're not going to get deer for hunting season. You have to take care of it. What, what, and so we need to be responsible there, but we can do some things that will make buck hunting a lot better than that antler restriction. We use the antler restrictions in a way as um, it was like the sweetener to have them take the medicine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you'll shoot these does and you back off those bucks, you're going to have the best deer hunting you've ever had in your life. Because the, the ones who survive are going to have better habitat, better food. They're going to be able to reproduce, survive better. And the bucks are going to grow faster. You're going to have nicer buck hunting than you've ever had in your life before. If mm-hmm. you don't shoot them and look later. Yeah. How many points? Where did that aspect of like the buck management come from? Was was that just like a personal desire of yours to say like, hey, I know we shoot lots of bucks right now. I want to shoot bigger bucks. Or was that was there like a, a demand for that from the hunting community that you saw? The demand, I mean, the idea came to us from Quality Deer Management Association. Mm. So Kip Adams, some of the other people from QDMA met with me <clears throat> and they talked about what they thought we should do. And they talked about antler restrictions and things like that. We were, all of us, biologists, all of us, were very skeptical of that. And, you know, you have it in your head like, uh, oh, that sounds like trophy management to me. Mm-hmm. Sure. The public doesn't like trophy management in state government. You'd say, I'm not sure that's, you know, where we want to go. But the more we talked to them and the more we went out and looked at where they were, I said, you know, this is, this is something the hunters are going, this is something that will be a real reward for the hunters. They're going, especially after we did the research and realized, oh my God, this state can grow big bucks. Just let them live. Yeah. And then for me, like one thing that was probably one of my greatest strengths is public meetings and getting down in the dirt and really ha- thrash it out with the general public, large audiences. And really, and um, I was often saying things no state employee should ever say. <laughs> like the guy who said, I'll shoot first, count points later you know and i would come down on him and say there's a place for you sir it's in it's called jail i mean that's a not something you'd expect a state employee to say but you'd have to be in the meeting and you were some mm-hmm. of you were yeah um you, i was getting abused a lot and so i let him abuse me but I, my goal was how many times in an hour lecture can i make them laugh really hard how many times in an hour lecture can i say something where they look at each you can see one look at the other one and go wow did you know that? No. So it's G whiz statistics, mm-hmm. things like that. Like, um, you know, why do deer have antlers? And you just go into things that say, wow, it's, I'm really interested in that, but I, I really don't know why. And you'd go through the theory about it and you'd make, and you make them laugh hard with jokes and stuff. So what happens over an hour's time is they go, you know, he might not be the brightest bulb out there, but he is, he's funny. And he's a diehard hunter like yeah. us. Yep. I, I think he deserves a chance to at least give it a try. So yeah. That's what gave me the chance to get out of the box. But then, and then, but I would be really blunt, really blunt. I know some people were nervous. I know the legislators who sponsor a lot of these meetings heard me say, I would tell them, here's a, something, you know, I, I would say, we're not going to get this right on the first pass through. We're going to have to try and see what works and what doesn't. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You want to hear a mistake I made last year? This is something I supported. We ran the hunt and realized, whoa, that didn't work well. I made a mistake. But we can't get to where we need to go. Can't fix this for all of us without trying to do something. We'll find out what works and what doesn't. We'll get it right eventually, but it's going to take us a while to kind of tune this thing up. The legislators almost always would say to me, don't ever admit a mistake. I disagree. (laughs) So many nights, um, people at the podium would say, you know, when you hooked me, you hooked me when you said you made a mistake. It's good to hear somebody say sure. and admit they made a mistake. 100%. And I think by just like, for me, it was like I was puking my soul up from the bottom of my <laughs> my yeah. inner innards, you know, just uh, what I believed came out. I think they said, you know, you probably shouldn't say some of that stuff in public, but 
we know where he stands. And you know what? I'm not too far from there either. I think that's let's let him have a chance. Basically, that's what you have to do. 100%. And then um, once they get a look at it, you know, once they saw that restrictions was working, you had way more support and it, it cooled down a lot. Wow. Well, I mean, one of the things, Gary, that I remember, um, you know, antler restrictions were one, the concurrent buck doe season during the gun season was, I mean, I remember guys standing outside, you know, expos burning doe tags, you know, yeah. that they're like, yeah. they're like, I'm going to buy them all up and I'm going to burn them. <laughs> like they literally yeah. had a fire burning the doe tags. Yeah. Um, Do you know how that works? Do you know how that impacts the deer herd and how that impacts the game commission? <laughs> Most people haven't thought about it. They think you burn the tags, the yeah. doe won't die. You know what happens? Every year you calculate how many doe tags do I have to sell sure. in order to shoot a doe? How many does do I want to shoot? You know, I want to shoot maybe 250,000 does, 300,000 does. And when these guys burn the tags, burn them all you want. Thanks. We're going to shoot more. more. Yeah. Because all you do is say, well, it used to be that, you know, um, 10 tags would shoot five does. Now you get 10 tags and you only shoot two to two and a half does. Yeah. Okay, well, it issued twice as many tags. You still get them. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Yeah. But I mean, the people, the people feel like they're really doing something. And I have to tell you though, you know, it it would be easy to, as a biologist, it would be easy to get really angry at those people. That's not how you're going to solve this problem. These are good people who want to do the right thing. They love what they're doing. They may not understand how all this stuff works, but you don't want to attack them. You yeah. want to try to work. Yeah work with them about, how, you know, if we can do what we want to do, they're going to like it, but we have to get them there somehow. Yeah. And so, you know, those lectures, I think, was a way that I was able to get <clears throat> people to listen and say, well, I, I'm not sure about all that, but I, this part of it I like a lot. I think this we should at least let them have a chance. That's what allowed us to survive. And once we, uh, once they saw the response that the, when you had these concurrent seasons and all these other changes that we made, so the sun still came up. They were still getting deer, and then once the antler restrictions went through, it's like it. That was the, that was the sweetener that really made it stick. That's when they said, "Whoa, it's, we like we like antler restrictions." That's something they did learn. Yeah. When you guys were like originally discussing antler restrictions as a means of managing for bigger bucks and stuff like that, was there discussion or concern around like uh, the issue of like high grading? So I know today, you know, you have guys in certain parts of the state that look and say, you know, it's great. It's awesome. We have older bucks, but, you know, anymore, it's like the, the ones that make it to extreme maturity, yep. these ones we want to yep. shoot, you know, yep. they had been six points their whole life. Yep. Yeah, I had wondered about that, but we looked at um, the age of bucks and what we found was that uh, very few bucks at age two are wise. It's really rare. Mm hmm. And you just almost never see it at three. The correlation isn't as good as you might think it would be. And so the other thing is, don't forget half of it, it comes from the doe side as well. It's not just the buck. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that, Gary? They're, so why is you're talking about like four point? Or yes, si six two point. on a side. Okay. As a two-year-old. Yeah, So because most of them are what, eight, see, eight points? Most of those whys are yearlings. Yep. Almost all, more than 90% of the whys, spikes and whys are yearlings. Yep. It's really unusual to have a spike or a Y as a two-year-old. Sure. It happens. in real. Well, who, who, who will do that? Get a spike. Get a, uh, a, a late-born fawn. Yeah. Or habitat. Barely survives the winter. Comes back as a yearling with a one-inch yep. antler. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the following year, he might have a nice Y. That can happen, but it's really unusual. Right. And so what I was wondering, you know, we looked at that. I talked to a lot of people that were in genetics and all that and tossed it around. And, and uh, basically, you know, we were all concerned about that high grading situation. But the more I talked to those people, they said there's a lot more into this other than just what's on that head. There's so much more going on that you sure. don't realize. Sure. Yeah. And there's a lot of it coming from the doe side as well. The genetics aren't the, for, for the ability to raise large bucks is not, it's in the genetics of the oh, doe definitely. as well. Definitely. I think, I think yeah, it's more I about a, so not, not even from a genetic conversation, but more of a, what is the word calling? It's yeah. just literally from a, you know, you know, this deer's two years old and it's got, you know, whatever, it's got 12 points or something. It's like, oh, that's yeah. obviously a, tar a target. We're going to, and so yes. over the course yes. of whatever, 20, 30 years, you know, we've yep. effectively killed those and they've been more vulnerable to being harvested basically. Yeah. Yeah.
Sure. Yeah, they're going to get they're going to get more hunting pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still, I don't know of anywhere they've shown any evidence where the antler size have shrunk down as a result of that. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Now, if I think if all the genetics were only traveled, if if all the genetics for antler size was controlled only on the uh, Y chromosome, you'd have more trouble. Yeah. The fact that half of it's on the X chromosome, which is having no selective pressure on that whatsoever. Yeah. Not shooting does because their offspring will have big racks. You know? Sure, right. Sure. Well, and, and on so, the flip side, I don't know. Something... I, on the flip side, I don't know how you can. Uh, w- what other management tactic can you employ? It's like, boy, you can barely trust guys to count a number of points. Like, let alone ask them to you know, shoot, shoot a deer say. that's two years old or older or it, three. Well, in Mississippi, they've run inside spread and main beam length, right. which is extremely hard to to yeah. judge. Yeah, you know, our guys could barely count points. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Well, it's amazing what they can do um, if you make them do it. It's amazing what they can do when they want to do it. Yeah. And sure. what I mean by that is, you know, we looked at that and said, what else could we do? You know, antler beam diameter, how heavy the rack in can be really nicely correlated with age. Well, you don't have calipers to, to yeah. walk up to them and smell, you know, see how wide is it? How wide, how heavy <laughs> is this rack? Yeah. And so uh, what about width? Well, yeah, width. It's fine, but if he's going by you broadside, you can't see how wide he is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, <clears throat> what is the most distinguishable thing? The easiest thing for the hunters to do is counting the points. points. Definitely. And yeah. But you cannot believe how many people, yeah, almost every night, somebody would come up. They really hated the idea and said, if this buck comes true and I can't count the points, it's going to get away. And he said, I could have got a buck. Now I'm not going to get a buck. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't like that. And I said, well, let's look at it the other way. Somebody else is out there hunting and they see a buck and they would have killed it, but they couldn't kill it because they weren't sure whether it had the po- enough points or not. And he gets away. That's the whole point. Yeah. That's We're counting point. on half of our yearling bucks to get away. Yeah. Because. We're trying to keep them alive. Mm-hmm. The game is not to exterminate every single buck that's out there, which seems to be the game for the last hundred years trying to change the game to let more of them get so you better get used to seeing a buck and not just killing it yeah so gary because when it, you see that buck next year you're not going to have to look twice and know whether he has three points yeah or not. exactly it's, it's going to be obvious I, I like to jokingly say that like the antler restriction is the sta- is the state's acknowledgement that we're all too stupid to age deer on the, on the, on the hoof so at well, least we can count number of points yeah I think what's really important here, though, is that things change over time because the things that are happening in Pennsylvania now were unfathomable to imagine, you know, 20 years ago. Absolutely. Because you say, uh, I'm not going to shoot that buck. Let me look it over. You think he's four years old? No, I think he's three. We should give him another year. Yeah. How do you know it's three? Well, people have educated themselves a lot at looking at the morphology of deer and saying, yeah, this guy looks like he's a three-year-old. He, he's going to have significantly larger antlers next year. He's got good potential. Let's let him go. You can do that, and you will do that. A lot of people will do that. If you have enough land where enough adjacent landowners have the same rules so that you don't let this guy live three years, and then somebody shoots him as soon as he crosses the line. Yeah. And so that's what's happened up in, in, in Wayne County that I was talking to you about. So it's just, you know, maybe a 1,000 acres or more adjacent where nobody's wanting to shoot anything unless it's at least four years old mm. it's unbelievable what it's happens so then. hard to fathom you know 20 years ago and where we were you know and and that's the qdma like in a large part that's you know who put out the chart those are iconic those charts of how what does a two three four yes. year old deer look like mm. yep. it was Let cool go, so yeah the industry grow, for better or worse promoted yep. like you know yep. uh, you know we we put a commodity on like big antler deer and the qdma was like the educational resource and so undoubtedly we're we've taken that path we had so many people working against us, but QDMA was with us right from the start. Yep. Literally, QDMA, we, I invited them to every meeting, uh, all 20, 224 meetings that I had, to whatever it was, 220-something. Hmm. Um, they were invited, and uh, they'd set their booth up. Well, yep. I really stimulated um, membership for QDMA. Sure, at least, sure. We yeah, had, you know, that was their people. heyday at that point. You know, those because yeah, they had they had been rooted in the South, right? But yeah, you know, right. in the Midwest and the Northeast, especially, like they were very, they weren't known at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so but those kind of things, of hunters, yeah, in a state like Pennsylvania, is Huge. so much way bigger than in the South. 
except for Texas. Texas is a really big state too. Yeah. But uh, it was, so I worked with QDMA and wanted them there every single night because I wanted to have hunters there talking to hunters. So it wasn't the state government telling them sure. what they can do or can't do with their deer. Yeah. You know what I mean? They sure. need to have, uh, I was talking the talk of QDMA, but I was a state employee. They just don't trust you. They don't know. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many nights I was out there doing lectures and some guy would come to a microphone and say, I know what you're up to. We know what you're up to. You might as well just confess it. You work with and work for insurance insurance companies. companies. (laughs) You're getting paid a lot of money under the table by the insurance companies so that uh, we'll shoot these deer off. They don't have to pay as many claims. Well, in reality, the claims that you pay wherever you are is dictated by how many claims they have to pay. All they do is just raise the rates. That's right. To however much money they need to off balance what it is that they're paying out. It's a, it's a fractional thing. Yeah. You know, we're going to collect a hundred percent. We're going to maybe spend 80% on payment. We're going to have a 20% profit or whatever that model is. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with running around paying deer biologists or anything like that. It's all math. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I would say that night after night, I remember I was in the Allentown fair uh, or the Allentown Sports Show in the spring of the year, we had maybe 500 people there. I was came in from doing electro somewhere else, and I would just I shot through the door, and I only had five minutes to get on. I, I ordered a hot dog and a coke. And I'm like stuffing this stuff in my face as fast <laughs> as I can. I'm literally walking up the stairs to talk, putting a hot dog in my mouth. And and when I bought it, I remember I gave the guy a twenty dollar bill, and the change was like seventeen ones. That's what he gave me. <laughs> I stuffed him in my front pocket and I was up there and I started talking and so on. And that's what happened later on. And I, the guy said, you know, we know what you're up to. You're getting paid. You know, you're, you're getting paid from these guys, um, from the insurance companies for shooting these deer off. So they don't have to pay as much. And, uh, but he made a reference to money. I think he made a reference to stuffing my pockets with money or something was something like that. And I thought, I just quickly in my head, I said, oh, my God, I've got 18 ones in my, 17 ones in my pocket right now. And I said, go ahead and do it. And, and uh, <laughs> I just walked up to the front of the stage where they could see me really well. And I said, you know what? You got me. And I reached in my pocket and I pulled out 18 or 17 ones and threw them in the air. And they just went all over the place. And I and the crowd just roared with laughter. <laughs> they were all $1 bills. You know? That's hilarious. <laughs> wow. and I mean- so I, just, I, was, I went along with it, just made a joke out of it. But people, that's what they really believed, you know, that um, they I was. S- they still do. Some of these people were saying it. I, I had respect for prior to that saying, God, you guys believe the weirdest, wildest things. You know, it just hmm. it seems like they... anything about it. You could say, yeah, that does make sense. I bet he is getting the money. You well, know, it's, they... it's a it's a follow the money, you know, trail. I mean, like you said, even today, guys will look at anytime there's a whatever, a coup or a, you know, to kill more deer guys point to the insurance agencies or they look at, yeah. they try in their Lobbyist. mind to figure out who's got financial yeah. interest in these deer being eliminated or decreased. And well, I ran that program for five and a half years and I am still waiting for my first phone call from an insurance company. I've never had an insurance <laughs> person ever contact me at any point. Yeah. That's wild. Mm. Well, yeah. so Gary, you, you work there till what? 2005 then? Yeah, I, I mean, I started working for the Game Commission in June of um, 1974. Wow. Or no, 77. 77. I started working on bears in June of 74, and then I got hired by the Game Commission to run their bears program in June of, um, or late April, I guess, of 77. And I stayed on bears until September uh, 1999. And that's wow. when I got tapped to try to make substantive changes to the deer management program. Uh, as a result of trying to fix forest ecosystem problems and uh, and not lose the green certification for the state forest system, that's how I got into it. So I mean, and I, I stayed with them till the end of uh, two thousand four. Okay, so I mean, since two thousand four, we've obviously had a lot of changes there. Uh, you know, we get a handful or a couple Sunday hunts now. We've yep. got crossbows in archery season. We've got. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, those are the biggest ones probably mm-hmm. since, since yeah. 2004. I mean, what, you know, as you're kind of seeing, have been have lived it and seeing these things change now, I mean, any, any thoughts on like, 
you know, uh, guys ask all the time, we should have Sunday hunting or guys say all the time, we shouldn't have crossbows in the archery season. I mean, from yeah. a biologist yeah. perspective, you've, you've lived the agency side and the management side. Yeah. I mean, some of this is science and some of it is just plain like politics. It's just social yeah. preference. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my concern as a manager was to make <laughs> sure that we were taking care of the resource. Uh, when it comes to, and I said this a lot of times to the hunters, I said, when it comes to shooting deer, they would say, should you have a, should you have a, should crossbows be legal? Should, uh, you know, what should the specs be on muzzle loaders? Should they be primitive or could we have modern ones with modern cartridges? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I said, you know, as a manager, uh, I want to know how many there are. I want to have a good idea of how many there ought to be. And then I want to get the right number in the right places. Right. I don't mm -hmm. care how we do it. The people of this state want the Russian army to come over and shoot them. We can do that. Mm -hmm. What do you guys want? I'm a biologist and I, I want to get the numbers right. I don't care how we do it. I do personally, but my job dictates sure. that I want to listen to you. Yeah. What do the people of Pennsylvania want? I want to try and help you as much as I can. There are some things that I'm not interested in doing. In, I'm not interested in making you happy so that you can shoot really large numbers of deer for a short time. The forest gets destroyed. The deer go to nothing. And now you're mad as hell at me because the deer aren't there. You know why they aren't there? Because you did what you demanded that we do. Right. That has been a problem for over 100 years. The state of Pennsylvania, the people have been so successful at forcing the agency to not shoot enough deer that's destroyed the forest a lot. I mean, has enormous damage has been done to the forest ecosystem multiple times over the last hundred years or so. Ironically, you know, what happens is, is that the hunters will go, they might go to the commissioners, but often they go directly to the legislators. Right. They say the game commission is killing off the deer herd. Um, you know, my grandfather hunted, my father hunted, I hunt, my kids are trying to hunt, but we're not seeing much out there. If we don't get more deer, then we're going to quit hunting. And then there won't be any license fees and nobody will be able to pay the game commission and so on. And so we, unless the game commission, um, stops shooting does or seriously reduces the number of does, then, um, I don't want to, you know, this is a real problem that has to be solved. So the legislators will go then um, to the board of commissioners and say, you know, our hunters want you to shoot more. They want you to shoot fewer deer, does. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you, but that's not the right thing to do with science. No, you're not hearing. We have to shoot fewer does. And so then, and then it's, you're not, obviously you're not hearing me. So here's what you will hear. If you don't allow if you don't start reducing the number of antlerless harvests and and cut down on the doe harvest cut down on the antlerless allocation then we are not ever going to give you a license increase do you hear me now oh yeah we hear you yeah it's not the right thing to do it's the political it's, it's pressure the, yeah yeah and it's gone on for 100 years but and i'm not saying it to be nasty or mean to legislators I'm saying this is a system that's 100 years old, and ironically, the hunters are demanding to have fewer antlers deer shot, shoot, shot, thinking that they will then have a greater deer population, when in fact, that's the thing that will lead to the demise of the deer herd faster than anything else. And so you get the exact opposite response. But politically, they're very effective, and then the agency many times in the last 100 years have reversed what they wanted to do, what they needed to do, to try and stay alive, basically. I understand why they did it, but it's it's to be in a really tough position. Hmm. And it's hard. If you're out there on the, trying to sell this stuff, it's unbelievably hard. I mean, I don't care. Like if I went to restaurants, if I went to a bowling alley, I don't care where I'd go. Somebody would walk up to me. A lot of them would say, thanks for fighting. We believe in what you're doing. But two on 10 would come in and swear and scream and yell and just get really nasty. To wow. me my wife to my kids it's it's a really bad way to live you don't want to do that for very long no 
And that's gone on for a long, long time. And so that's that's been the problem. That's that, been the problem. That's why you live in California. <laughs> well, at the end of my stint working for the Game Commission, there came a time when I could not meet with my team and talk about viable ways to fix deer management without having uh, an administrator present. Mm. And the administrator would say to me, you're not allowed to talk about that. And I said, my job is not to just please you. My job is to give you, my team and I, to, to provide scientific evidence of what is the right thing to do and give you an option to pick from. And basically, I, I couldn't do my job anymore, and I left. And so did wow. some of the other team members. That's what happened. Where was this administrative oversight coming from? Like from whose office? The Gang Commission's office inside yeah. the agency. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, holy cow. So at right. one at one point, literally having, you know, political immunity. Gary, do what you need to do. We got to make this right to you can't say that. Yes. And mm. you know how that happened? 9-11. Mm. Oh, really? Sure. How so? Don Ridge was the governor. Yep. He was giving us immunity to really do what we needed to do. And on 9-11 happened, President George Bush Sr., hired Tom Ridge to run down and they started a, a whole new organization, yeah. Homeland Security. Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. He was the original um, Secretary of Homeland Security. When he left, it didn't take long, and I was a dead man. <laughs> wow. I didn't have wow. <laughs> and, and you know what? I'll tell you. I don't blame anybody who did what they did. Yeah. And... uh I'm going to get an award next month at the Game Commission office. It's one of the first times I've been back there since I left in 2004. And it's the um, Lifetime Achievement Award from them. And now the people who um, who were there when I was there are gone. These are new people who knew what happened. And they, you know, I think they were trying to make it right, basically, after all this time. I but bet. honestly, um, a lot of things happened that weren't fair. But um, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything else because they can never take away how I feel about my team and myself for standing up what we knew was the right thing to do. You pay a price for doing that, but you also, when it goes well and it goes right, when I go back to Pennsylvania, which is five or six times a year, I'm in there for a long time when I come in. I was, there, I was back there seven weeks, October and November. But when I drive around in Pennsylvania and I see the forest, and I know there's generation, regeneration that occurred that wouldn't have occurred if we hadn't done that. And when I look around and I meet with hunters from all over the state and they show me the size of the racks they have, some of them fought me venomously on the antler restrictions in 2002 and come back and say, my son and I have shot the largest bucks we've ever killed in our life since the antler restrictions went in effect. M many of them won't say they were wrong. They'll just say, thanks for hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> and they were the ones that were punching me every day back sure, then, you know. Sure. But what what it's it comes back to me like parenting, where there are times when being a father in a family or a parent of any either sex, when you have to stand up for what you believe is right, the right thing to do. I don't care what you say. You know, you can scream at me and tell me you hate me and everything else, but in the long run, as a parent, this is my responsibility and I'm gonna do it as well as I can. The same as a biologist. You know, you in your heart of hearts, you know what the right thing is to do. When you see blatant violations like that, I don't want to be a part of it. And I was proud to be, you know, the opposition that was really, it got really, really cantankerous. I think that there was a lot of people who didn't like me at all. There were fewer people who didn't respect, even though they didn't like me, they respected what I was trying to do. Sure. And then as time went on and the results came in, it's like, wow, we didn't think this would happen. Kind of like what he said would happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't hear anybody today, Gary. I mean, when we mention your name and stuff, like everybody holds you with high regard around here. They're like, yeah, yeah he's the reason we have these big deer. Yep. Something that I think is really, 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 really important to know that I hope that the people who are listening to this understand is I was nothing more than the face. I was the face of this. I was the one who was in the meetings and fighting they saw me on tv they heard me on the radio they saw me in the magazines and stuff 
But the real credit goes to the team of people who told me what is the right thing to do. They bared their souls and they they put, put it all on the line and just really poured it out. And without them, I couldn't have been able to know exactly what I should be doing most of the time. Yeah. So you, you talked in that in that group, Gary. You had you had Dr. Diefenbach. Uh was Brett Wallingford in that group yes. at that time? Yep. Brett Wallingford was in there. Um God, there were a number of people. Um Was Chris Brian Rosenberry Kistler. there? Yes, yeah. Chris Rosenberry was there. He yeah. was in the middle of it. Yeah. Um Brian Schistler was in it. Yeah. He was very influential. What I did is, I mean, um, when I had a chance to run the program, they let me run it however I wanted to run it, basically. It's like my job was to try and fix the problem. And it was untraditional that I could be, you know, the inside the organization, they made a joke out of it and said I was the dear czar. Yeah, I remember and, that. Yeah, they called me the dear czar. And it, I understand why it made people mad. I would be mad, too. If I was a lifelong biologist inside and I was trying to solve a problem and nobody was letting me do it, and all of a sudden this other guy – you know, the guy with the golden gloves, you know, what made him have all these opportunities? Well, it just happened to be the political consequences of what they were trying to solve. They were willing to to do it. And we were getting pressure from the governor on down. And that allows you to say, let's dream our wildest dreams and we will make it happen. Otherwise, you can dream all you want. You're going to catch a two by four on the side of your head and then your dreams are gone because you yeah. can't make it happen because you don't have enough clout to have immunity to, to let your ideas actually play out in real life well to that tune i mean how, how would that situation have looked at different without political immunity and like is that something we see today because i mean no, tr truthfully no. we look across the country gary and we're like man you know doing what's right and i mean not not to throw anybody in the bus but but, but the herd management and which i'm assimilating with doing what is right seems to be a distant second to how do we not get in trouble with these politicians well there's a lot to unpack there but to me the single person most responsible for fixing the deer situation in Pennsylvania and the, and the antler restrictions is Tom Ridge. Mm -hmm. He's the governor of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Wow. Now, Tom Ridge, I don't think he ever, I don't think I even talked to him about antler restrictions. He just wanted me to, to really address getting that herd under control. I could use antler restrictions as a tool to win the support of the hunters because that's something that they wanted. If they would shoot enough does we put antler restrictions into effect and you could have better hunting than you've ever had before so like in my situation people weren't telling me what i needed to do they just said um f just fix this try to fix it and um because of the politics of the past we did a lot of that work independently we did it the people who were meeting were meeting you know they never knew where we were meeting and initially, the people on that team, uh, I think, and I, I would think Dwayne probably felt the same way. In the beginning, I said, we want to do this and this and this. Almost everybody in the room started laughing and said, people have been trying to do that for 100 years. You know, you can't do that. And I said, we're going to try. And I said, I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking that you tell me that if your life depended on getting this right, how would you do it? Mm -hmm. Not just how do you do it. What is the sequence of doing it. You can't make all those changes at one time. Which one happens first? And that's when it started, you know, people like Dwayne said, let's do a massive study immediately and find out how big are the bucks growing? Let's answer the question, how, what does that antler restriction need to be? Is it a spike? A Y? Three on a side? Four on a side? That's a really good model, but we can't answer that. And I don't know of any other state that ever took the time and the money no. To go figure out what you ought to do. They just want antler restrictions. Yeah. As soon as the legislature knew that I was looking at antler restrictions, there was one of the legislators came to me and just breathing fire down my throat saying, let's do it now. Let's do it right now. And I said, no, we are gathering massive amounts of data. We want to do it right. We need to take this fall and, you know, we're going to look at every buck we can find in every county and township in the state of Pennsylvania. And we're going to be able to answer the question, what kind of antler restrictions should we put in? Because we don't know the answer to that yet. We'll know it right after the deer season. And he got madder than hell. He got really mad at me. And, you know, you know, you say you want to do this, but you're not doing anything. I said, we're going to do it right. We have to do it right. Yeah. You have to find out what, what do we need to know. 
what we, we need to get, what we need to know to make the decision. Once we do that, then we go out and we radio collar hundreds, over 500 bucks. It's not like, gee, I think it worked. It worked. Here's how it worked. Here's what happened. And so it's expensive. It costs a lot of money to do that. And it takes a lot of manpower to do that. You start catching thousands of deer. Mm -hmm. Gee, that's a lot. What happens is the credibility of the agency and the state really skyrockets because these guys, they know what they're doing. They're handling thousands of deer. They're looking at statistics on all this stuff, and they're making their decisions based on that data from Pennsylvania right now. If you don't have that, you don't have the heart and soul of the people. If you have the research and you have the money to do it, and then we got that money from other places. That wasn't Game Commission money that did that. That came in from the Mellons and other you know, people that that really believed in trying to fix the ecosystem hmm. and also were interested in hunting, the future of hunting. So we got external money that allowed us to go look at those things, which were really expensive to answer the questions. Once we did, I mean, when you compare Pennsylvania to other states, there was like when, when we went for antler restrictions, I can't tell you how many times at uh, deer group meetings, uh, biologists from other states were really, really angry, really angry about us putting antler restrictions into effect. We're screwing up all the states. Now they want us to do it in our state too. And it's like, well, maybe you should. It's like, it's crazy. Antler restrictions won't work. Why not? They'll just shoot them and let them lay. How do you know that? Oh, I know my hunters. So maybe you do, maybe you don't. I didn't, I thought they were going to shoot them too. But the difference between you and I is we spent over a million dollars to answer the questions. And right. to our amazement, we didn't know them as well as we thought we did. And by God, they worked. Well, they won't work in New Jersey. They won't work in um, West Virginia. They won't work in Vermont, New Hampshire. The deer biologists themselves really angry about what we did because it was putting pressure on them. I understand why they're angry. All I'm saying is you may not, you know, you're sitting here telling me you think you know. I thought I knew too, and I didn't. Yeah. So you might want to think about that a little bit. You might not know what you think you know. Well, I mean, I think that that entire time frame as you guys are traveling around having these conversations, probably even till today, is the most education that the Pennsylvania deer hunters ever received around deer management. I mean, oh, yeah. that that yeah. conversation that you had with them over that the course of the, you know, those couple years. I yeah. mean, they they have never been talked to and educated on those topics ever before. It's the first yeah. time they're hearing most of it. Yeah. I think there, if you look at the history of Pennsylvania, there were other times when uh, there was major efforts that went on, not, not that, uh, not on that scale, but on a, it was pretty good efforts. Those people who tried those efforts, really, it was not, uh, it was not good for their careers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I assume you knew, you obviously knew, you knew that this was a chance that you're walking into a sentence that's going to end the career. I was quite sure that it would. And I, I, I said that to Ridge when I talked to him. Yeah. He, he said, why aren't, you know, kind of like, why aren't you interested in taking this position? I said, I, it'll end my career. And he said, it doesn't make sense. Why would it end your career? So when you sit down and look at the history of deer management in the state of Pennsylvania, you understand, you understand what you're getting into. I do it again in a minute. I do it for the same reason why kids enlist to go in the army. Yeah. Especially when something bad happens or what happened right after Pearl Harbor, when thousands and thousands of people immediately signed up to go in the, in the service. It's, I, I felt like I knew at that moment, even though I had a fabulous career with bears, I knew at that moment I had an opportunity that no one has ever had that I know about and probably no one ever will have in a hundred years. And I thought, you know, we have the chance to do what no one else could do in a hundred years. We I'm not saying we'll do it. It's not saying we can do it, but I was had enough experience to know that if the governor wants it solved, and you can get kind of political immunity to move forward <laughs> uh, aggressively to do what needs to be done. It, I mean, that doesn't excuse you if you make stupid mistakes or stupid decisions or you act arrogant and cocky about, hey, the governor's, I never told people that at all. It was years later before I ever mentioned people that we had that support. But um, I recognized that with that kind of support, we could do, we could do make changes that no one else could have. And I was familiar enough with the history of deer management in Pennsylvania that I felt very bad for people who were a lot smarter than I am who got destroyed in deer management in the last 100 years. And I thought, 
to, to all of them, but more importantly, to the resource itself, to the forest, to mm -hmm. the deer, to the future of deer hunting. You know, I believe in that stuff. I don't, it's not what happens to me. If you have a chance to do that, then sign up, enlist, and go. Just do it. And it, it turned out the way I thought it would turn out. Yeah. But uh, what I didn't expect, I'm 72 years old now. I couldn't be happy. I have had an unbelievably fun life, and it's still going on. I mean, um, the bear work was, oh, my God, it was so exciting, so much fun for 25 years. The deer work wasn't fun, um, but it was important. And I felt like then I was doing something that really mattered. You know, mm -hmm. I was doing something that no, nobody else is going to have this chance probably for a long, long time. And I thought, and I felt honored, and I still feel honored to have worked with the people I worked If I didn't have people like Dwayne Diefenbach and all the rest of the people on that team, I couldn't have done that. I didn't know enough about stuff to know how to do it. My job was to try and lead the team and give them the inspiration that this is not hypothetical. This isn't like a test question on a, an exam you're going to give at a university. This is real. We're flying a real plane. And we're going to land it, and we hope like hell we put it on the runway. Could you help me get it on the runway? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, it's like, you know, I think everybody pretty much was like, this isn't going to happen. All, virtually everybody said, you guys are crazy. You know, this isn't going to end well for you guys. But after the first seasons of Bag Limits, everything that I asked for, I got. Wow. I shouldn't say I, the team. team. You know, we all talked about this. It wasn't my decision. It was mm -hmm. the team's decision. Of what's the best thing to do? And then all of that became reality. When that became reality, the other members on the team realized, wow, this is not hypothetical. We better be careful what we tell them because it may be, it'll become reality. And if it becomes reality, we are then responsible yeah. for what goes wrong. And I think for me, the second year, and I think for all everybody on the team, once you got to the second year and you saw that all the changes we recommended the first year went through, it's like, wow, you better be careful here because you're going to, You're going to get it probably. And if you get it, it's your, you own it. Yeah. And you'll take that to your grave. If you make a serious mistake, you'll never be able to walk away from it. They'll always remember. Yeah. And so the tone of it changed. And for me personally, it was an honor to serve with those people and to help, you know, help them on the team and to, to lead the charge out in the public to make it happen. I had no idea, you know, whether it would work or wouldn't work, but we were giving it every ounce of energy we could have. And yeah. without their help, I never would have taken it in the right direction, I'm sure. They said so many things I didn't realize. Like, wow, really? How does this work? How does that work? And then I started, you know, poking around and figuring stuff. The other thing is I have to be very careful about what I hear. It doesn't matter what I hear. It doesn't matter. Why? What you fail to realize is when you're leading a project like that, You have people that are spending a lot of money and a lot of time coming after you to change your mind. Yeah. I'm tour I every one of those winters I gave a lecture within 20 miles of every Pennsylvanian in the state. 70 lectures. <sighs> everywhere. Within 20 miles of every Pennsylvanian typically. There're very few places that wouldn't have been covered by that. And so what happens is these people who really feel really really indebted to try and fighting you They send people out to oppose you. They'll set up little uh, situations where they come with posters. It's just like anti-hunters. It's the same thing. They come out with the posters, banging them, getting the megaphones, screaming and yelling, just trying to just take everything out of order. And so I hear all this screaming and yelling and everything. But when I would call Dwayne Diefenbach, what are you hearing? Or I talk with Brett, you know, Wallingford or Brian Schistler, or the other people of uh, the team, like Rosenberry, Chris Rosenberry. And they're like, we're not hearing. I'd say, man, I'm getting pounded on this stuff. What about you? No, Nothing. I'm not. Yeah. What are you hearing? And when I, I started to realize, you know what? I'm being targeted. Mm -hmm. I'm on tour. I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm doing <laughs> 70 lectures in 90 days. I'll, most breakfasts, I'm out there eating with legislators. Lunchtime, I'm doing... Um, Newspaper, um, what do they call them? Newspaper, what did they call it? When all the editors would come out. Editorial board meetings. Oh, board meeting, yeah. Yeah. And so you're meeting a, a group of, of uh, the people from the newspaper 
And then they would put out a series of articles saying whatever it was you're talking about. That's really powerful because they just blanket the area. It's a blitz. You know, it's a real blitz. And then you'd have a press conference often just before you would do your lecture. <laughs> and you'd have and you'd have record crowds. I mean, often some of the biggest crowds ever assembled in these little towns were that deer tour. Wow. And so uh, obviously once you start drawing really big crowds, then they're like, wow, what's going on? It's like uh, people who are really rational, not emotional, but really like deer, they start coming in large numbers. And the radical people are saying things that are crazy, like, you know, um, if you follow his advice, the you'll have to go to a museum to see what deer look like, because you're going to kill them all. Mm -hmm. And more rational people would say, ah, that doesn't sound right. But, you know, it is getting crazy. He's drawing really big crowds. Let's go and find out what this is all about. And so you'd go in there and when you would pour your heart out and just say, I don't have all the answers. I'm an avid deer hunter. I believe this is the right thing to do. Those people would say, God, he's, I, I give him a chance. Yeah. That really hot headed people would carry on and it made them a target when they'd come to the microphone. I would go after him and the crowd would like it. Mm -hmm. You don't do it until you know the crowd is really hooked. Yeah. And then these people get out of hand. They start swearing at me and just getting really disrespectful, which they had a history of doing. And you call their bluff and really get in their face, you know, over the microphone and the crowd, they like it. Sure. They'll screw. And I mean, you'll get, you know, the whole crowd will start either laughing or so on. You can literally get them to leave the room. The problem is I always wondered whether they're going to be waiting for me at the car. And the <laughs> sure. I never had it. I never did. I mean, Gary, how do you, uh, I mean, do you, do you keep tabs on like what's happening with your management, uh, I guess in Pennsylvania, but in other surrounding states today? You know, not, I'm not on top of it. There's lots of people who know a lot more about it than I do. Um, in a general way, I do. And I've been, I was, I've done contract work where I came into uh, Wisconsin. Uh, the governor of Wisconsin brought me in with two other people, Dr. Deer. You know him? Oh, yep. yeah. Yep. He was one of them. And then I was trying to think of the other guy. I think he's from South Carolina, who was a, who was a academic there. And then I was the one, I was the only one that ran a statewide program. The three of us were selected by the governor. Well, Dr. Deere got selected, and he picked me and this other guy from South Carolina. We went on tour in Wisconsin. Kroll picked you? Huh? Kroll picked you? Yeah, he did. Interesting. So we went on a tour in Wisconsin, and it was a very similar situation. The politics were very similar. Yeah. Only up there, they were worried about wolves wiping out the deer herd and stuff like that. But when you knew the statistics and what was going on, it was physically impossible for the wolves to wipe out the deer herd because they had like half a million deer in that area and they had uh, about a thousand wolves. They they still are. We get guys write us every day about the wolves up there. Oh, I know. I know. What happens there, though, it's not what the wolves kill that's causing the problem. It's the behavioral changes that occur when wolves become more abundant and uh, you go go to look at Yellowstone for seven, from 1920 to 1990. There were no 1925 to 1995. There were no wolves in Yellowstone National Park. That whole mm -hmm. ecosystem. They brought them in there in the 90s. I actually saw some of those wolves because I, I lead photo trips there often with uh, for a company called Jovenos Photo Safaris, and uh, out of Vashon, uh, Washington. I've been doing it since the late 80s. But so I I met with the people who were um, doing the research. I met with the people who. Um, we're running the studies and everything else. The coyote biologist was there. I remember I was talking to him. I said, what do you think is going to happen to your coyotes when those wolves come out? Because they hate coyotes. They oh, kill yeah. them like crazy. Mm -hmm. He said, my coyotes are bigger than the average coyotes. They work cooperatively like wolves. So I think they'll be able to hold their own. I didn't <laughs> say anything about that. Oh, boy. I don't think it's going to happen. No, probably not. And, and the wolves were in the pens. They were there already. And they were going to let them out within a week or two when I had my group there. Wow. They let those wolves out, and they just killed those coyotes like crazy Jeez. when they came out. That's what you'd expect. Yeah. So the the wolves were crying, but the red foxes were happy, really happy, because the coyotes have been pounding the daylights out of, yep. out, of, out of foxes. And when the wolves took over, they don't bother the foxes. So it got anyway, it's a complex situation, but it was really interesting what happened there when they did change that ecosystem by simply just introducing wolves. Hmm. So I mean, oh, my it, point was this. My point is, is that in Yellowstone, it was so easy to see really large herds of elk walking around, especially along the rivers. And after the wolves were there, boom, they're gone. Well, they must have killed them all. They didn't kill them all. What happened was along those rivers where they would graze um, and they also stripped all the vegetation. They ate the willows. They ate, So the, the willows weren't there. 
so there was nothing for the be beavers. The beavers disappeared, it, and on and on and on. The cutthroat trout and so on, which the beavers had to be there and so on. The whole system had been screwed up for seven years. Once they they didn't necessarily kill that many deer or elk, <clears throat> they they changed their behavior entirely. They weren't in great big groups anymore, feeding along the river. Um, why? Because along the river, it's a great place for wolves to ambush them. They can see them from a great distance away or smell them. They move around to where they're on the uh, other side of the bank, and then they come over the bank running, boom, you, you can catch them. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's a vulnerable place to be. So what happens after, you know, after uh, elk, their buddies start dropping dead because of being preyed on, they start moving away from the river and they start breaking up in smaller and smaller groups. What does that mean to hunters? They become a lot more alert. They're in smaller numbers. They're just much more careful and much more canny and a lot harder to kill. Mm. Sure. And that's even though the deer are still there, they might be in lower numbers than they were, but not as low as you think they are. They're just a lot harder to kill because they're so much more careful. Hmm. Interesting. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. And we got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. It's, it's interesting, like, uh, at, you know, as a hunter, from a hunter perspective, it seems like a lot of the issues that we have are more, like, uh, amongst one another. Like, it seems like a, a lot more, like, you know, human management is required. Yeah. We Absolutely. Frankly, we don't really hear a whole lot about, like, the ecosystem. I, mean, I can't remember the last <laughs> time you heard from the state about, like, well, a balance, balanced ecosystem. Like, that doesn't really matter. It's it's what hunters want and, you know, well, you're a, you're a small minority versus, you know, a large non-hunting and in, in you know, yeah. even anti-hunting population. So it's, it, it certainly is a weird place to be now. Like it's, it, that seems like a crazy situation that, that you were in and it's, it's like a, a, a victorious story. It's awesome. It seems fairly black and white, like from where I'm standing, looking back as compared to like, yeah. boy, everything seems so complicated now. It's like, how could we ever accomplish anything? It was always like that, except for that. And what makes it all work is that if you have, someone like a governor say this is a priority and we have to fix it and we'll do whatever we have to do to make it work all the formulas change yeah and then um if you have that kind of support behind you the things you used to dream about now are obtainable they will never have been they never will be again you get one shot at this it changes all the rules and then you move in and say we're we're not going to talk about it we're not going to study it to death we're going to fix this damn thing yeah. and we're going to do it quick Hmm. Yeah, that makes people really, really angry. Sure. Well, and in if that you situation, do it slowly it makes them angry. The yeah, only thing yeah, yeah. is, you'd never achieve it if you did it slowly. You got sure. They'd you stop have it. To win. It takes a massive effort <clears throat> to win enough support to beat back, you know, the the hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand people that are so angry they'll follow you to every place across the state and scream and yell into the microphone wherever you go. Well, that was not uncommon at all. The yeah. same guy would be in. 15 different locations. Yeah. Mm. They'd show up 300 miles away. Some of these guys had syndicated radio shows, things like that, or newspaper, syndicated newspaper. They were making money out of it, and they were making money stirring muck in the bottom. They sure. knew it wasn't true, and they were making money doing it. That I that bothers me still because the people don't know it, right? and they, um, they're muddying the waters for all of us to try and figure out. It's hard enough to figure out what to do then you have to figure out how are you going to have the blessings of the people to pull it off. And when you got people mucking it up like that, it makes it impossible sure. to fix it. Well, on top and of we all of that, I mean, it seems like, it seems like deer hunting was so simple back then. Like no, when you, it was when, not simple. I know it wasn't. I, I'm not, I'm not belittling that at all, but it's, with the situations, the technology, especially that we have now that's yeah. been implemented on top of the season, it seems to be where a lot of the turmoil is, 
is held? Well, there's a lot of, I mean, I'm not sure what you mean by that. If, explain that a little more like the, the crossbows, technology. cell cameras, exactly. corn yeah. pile, you know, liberalization oh, okay. of gun seasons. All these things seem to be like, yeah, cl- clouding, you know, what should be a fairly simple vision of game management. Yeah, it was there. I mean, I'll give you an example. Back in the 19, uh, it might have been the 80s, but Ohio, 80s or 90s, Ohio was going to, was considering having a crossbow season. Mm. And I remember going to a... Did they not already have one? I think it was the 80s is when it came in. Oh, okay. It's been around for as long as we can remember. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, But it it happened during my stint. Not when I was working on deer. I was working on beer. I was doing lectures. I would often go out in other states and do lectures at these large sports shows and stuff like that. And so I went to Ohio and... uh, I got my my PhD at West Virginia University with Dave Samuel, who was I know I know, Do- I know Doctor Dave well. Yeah, yeah. So um, he was my head advice, really nice guy. Yeah, and, you know, and he loved to hunt. Mm-hmm. But um, so I was involved in that early. And anyway, I, I wound up going to these sports shows in other states. I went to Ohio in the eighties when they were considering putting crossbows into effect, and uh, it hadn't happened yet. But the hunters were revolting. And when you went to the show, you got to the stand. They had an, uh, a crossbow there that had it had mud and dirt on it. The hunters, the hunters didn't want it. didn't want it. Is what you're saying? Well, I was like, "What the hell's wrong with this crossbow?" Oh, you know, for one dollar or five dollars, or it was, you can take and throw it as far as you can throw it. <laughs> you can hit it against the tree. You can do. They would take like my money. Eat on this thing. <laughs> you know, you pay them a dollar, and that gave you the privilege to to pound this thing into the ground. <laughs> and I'm looking at it. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. These guys are so um, committed to one aspect of one way of hunting a deer mm-hmm. that they're dividing. You're dividing hunters and subdividing and subdividing. It's a lot harder to to defend hunting when you're fighting each other. Like yeah. that. that was very blatant in Ohio. It happened, I think, in Michigan. It happened most places where it went. Well, so well Gary, those- who who was pushing for it? Where did that come from? Who who I wanted think the crossbow it? Crossbow industry was pushing for it. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that would make sense. Sure, yeah, that's who I think was pushing for it. But my response to that, I I've had I've been asked that question a thousand times. Should we be shooting with crossbows or bows or rifles? And I would say, you know, from a biologist perspective, from a management perspective, I don't care. It's not my none of my business. Sure. How you want to control the deer herd? I mean, we want it controlled. Scientifically, it doesn't matter whether that deer dies with a bullet or an arrow or a club right. or a bowling ball. You guys figure out how you want to do it. We just we just need the right numbers killed in the right area. Something going on. Grizzly bear. Just one second. Something's going on with my dogs. Sure. Right, right. Black bears, grizzly bears. Yeah. Pretty cool. Cool stuff. Let's not forget where we were at there. We're talking about crossbows coming into mm-hmm. Ohio, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really cool. Uh, P- PA guys are going to eat this shit up. Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, it was coming there. Just like this. Just like oh. All right. Yeah, they went down over the bank like they were on fire. I thought something was wrong. Oh, all right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry. They're so, good. Sorry. Yeah, they're okay. <laughs> good. Um, so, yeah, we were we were talking about that, you know, likely the crossbow manufacturers being the ones who were kind of pushing for it to pass. And they were coming into in Ohio. Ohio. Everybody was resistant. Yeah. But. Uh, and So you're saying well, from a biological standpoint, doesn't matter how they get killed. Yep, the same exact battle took place long ago between longbows and recurves. Yep, yep, yep. And I hunted with a longbow when I started in the '60s, and then um, we went to recurves. It's like those recurves; those are modern, yep. fiberglass. They're not wood. <laughs> you don't hunt with recurves. You got to hunt with like the Indians did. Sure. Yep. And then you had a recurve, and then you know we had recurves for a long time. And then we started to get count on, oh, this is like, you might as well have a gun. This Training thing is like, <laughs> you know, and, and you shouldn't be able to have a sight. 
and then you go to crossbows, crossbows and scopes and so on. And then no matter what the technology is, well, we started out having, you know, primitive muzzle loader season, you know, with uh, black powder and yep. uh, locks. no scopes, you know, you had mm -hmm. to pour the powder in a pan and everything. Um, and then now look at what you have. You've got uh, muzzle loaders that are incredibly accurate out long ways. Sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't like to get involved in those fights because that's, a hunter, I feel the hunters need to decide how they want to do it. As a hunter, I can say something, but as a biologist, it's like you guys figure out how you want to do it. Yeah. And we'll figure out how many have to die. Yeah. Gary, I know that when we talked uh, the first time, you and your son were hunting in Illinois, and yeah. we've heard a lot in Illinois. And again, Jared and I are recent hunters in Illinois. We haven't been hunting there very long. We hear a lot of people in Illinois talking about you know, deer herds going down. We're not seeing nearly as many deer. We need to stop shooting does. I mean, you being a hunter and a biologist being in Illinois, like what have, what have you seen there? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, the people there, like most places, the hunters are not interested in how much the doe weighed. Wow. These does aren't as heavy as they used to be. Right. I don't hear that complaint. It's like those antlers are smaller. I want to shoot a 140 class buck and it's getting a lot harder than it used to be. The reason for that normally is you're having more and more hunting pressure. There's, you know, there's people who are leasing and some of them are, it's a profit, they're guides mm -hmm. and they, uh, it's a business decision. You know, they all shoot instead of having a 140 minimum or 130 minimum, they're going to shoot them if they're any bigger than, you know, 110. Yeah. And you can't, you're not going to be shooting 150 bucks if, <clears throat> if all these local people start shooting 110s all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just yeah. It's the exact opposite of what happened in Pennsylvania. It is. Mm -hmm. I, if you had deer when they first get in there. They tend to also be really productive when they first get into an area. And in those areas, they haven't been around that many years. Um, and they had like no deer in a lot of those areas. You know, going not have to go back too many decades, and there were damn few people who are my age had lived much of their life and never saw any deer where they were. And the same was true in Pennsylvania when my dad's and my grandfather's time. Yeah. You know, if a deer sh track showed up in southeast Pennsylvania down there, it would be like people would get out of school, go go to the snow and look at the deer track, say, oh, my God, there's a deer here. Where'd that come from? Yeah. So we tend to think, you know, that's not the case. When I was running the bear program, you know, the vast majority of the bears that were killed in Pennsylvania up to the mid-1970s were killed in probably 15 counties. Two counties in the northeast, 10 in the north central. And wow. not a lot. I mean, there were some, but it was very few bears being killed anywhere else. Hmm. And then we closed bear seasons for a while. And then we closed them for a longer period of time in what we called the peripheral range, where there were very few bears. And then we stocked, trapped, and transferred pregnant females. As first, I used to haul them down and let them go. And during the summer, and almost all of them were killed in automobile crashes within 100 days. Wow. Because they're wandering around trying to figure out how to get home. If you haul them less than 100 miles, they come straight home. If you haul them over 250 miles, they don't come home. They mm. wander like crazy, though. They can go hundreds of miles. Not hundreds, but they'll walk hundreds of miles, but they're yeah, going to go a long, long way, yeah. and they aren't going to make it back. But they'll get killed somewhere in the process. Most of them did. So, well, this isn't good, and this isn't safe. There's a better way. And so what if we go into the dens and anesthetize a mother and haul her down with the cups? But you have to be careful. She might abandon the cups. But if you can keep them together, then they'll stay right where you put them. So I thought, what about it? What about if we let them get pregnant up in the Poconos or North Central Pennsylvania, the females, and then we haul them down between Christmas and New Year's just before they give birth? Just let them go. They'll find a den within two or three miles of where you let them go. Hmm. The cubs are born. They'll spring comes. They've got these little three, four pound cubs. They aren't going anywhere. And they just, it's like putting super glue on their butt. They'll be wherever you put them. That's where they're going to live. Mm. That's how you can restore bears in areas where you lost them before. And so, you know, we did it uh, in Southwest Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. we put a lot of them down there. A couple of them we took down in the Southern Somerset County and they crossed over <clears throat> to Garrett County, uh, Maryland. Yep. We passed the information on and then these biologists in uh, Maryland started to change the collars on them. We let them, let them track them. And two females I stocked there raised 28 cups in 10 years. Wow. <laughs> I mean, you know, the population filled in. So when I look today, like when I was a grad student and started with bears, I remember going to meetings where scientists were 
trying to get the bear listed as a uh, species of special concern, that if current trends continue, they'll be gone. They aren't going to be here much longer. They're going to disappear. And so um, we looked at, I mean, we the average harvest then was like 400 bears a year. That's it. Wow. And there's a lot of things that were different, but the numbers of bears were way, way lower. And over in my lifetime, since I started working on bears in you know June of 1974, Jesus, when I got here, it was like 2,500 bears when I, in Pennsylvania when I started working on them. When I, and now there's over 20,000 bears. Wow. I mean, are, are, most of the, are we still improving there? I mean, do you think we're... we're stabilized. The bear population has been stabilized at around 20,000. I don't think they want much more than 20,000. And they're in virtually every county except oh, yeah. Philadelphia and downtown Pittsburgh. And sometimes they get... They still are in downtown, downtown Pittsburgh every once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah right. they're in the trash. It yeah. is interesting that they're so close. Like in the Pittsburgh area, you know, we're not uh, 45 minutes yeah. from the Ohio yeah. line, and yet we have, like, none. My family farm is just across the Ohio border, across the river there. But we, you don't hear about bears at all. They'll yeah. claim that there are none in the state. Now, where are you at? Uh, are you in Pennsylvania or in Ohio? Uh, right now we're in Pennsylvania. I live just south of Pittsburgh. My family what lives uh, what uh, Washington, right on the Westmoreland-Allegheny yeah. border. Yeah, there's— yeah, that's on the very edge. Washington, what's the other one right there? Uh, what's the one right in the corner? Green. Green. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have had, we still have bears shot there occasionally. It's not a lot. You'll probably see more over time. I suspect like a lot of those old farms, the regeneration is probably, uh, succession hasn't moved along as fast there as it has as you move east. Yeah. In eastern parts like Westmoreland County and stuff like that. A lot of the old farms have grown over your farms will grow over too in time and you'll see that you'll see that trend continue. Yeah. We have a lot of old strip activity down in Green County especially. Yeah. It's old strip grind. They yeah. killed uh they supposedly they killed an 800 pound plus one in Fayette this year. Wow. Really? Yeah. We've had a few uh every every few years we get one in that neighborhood around 800. That's pounds. a monster. <laughs> oh, is it ever? And that's bigger than most of the interior grizzly bears. Yeah, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Mm. It was right up the road here. Yeah. That's one thing I love about Ohio Bears are cool. I, uh, you know, I love bears, but I love that Ohio doesn't have them. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've ever. Uh, there's been reports down on the river, down where I'm at in Ohio, every once in really? a while. Yeah, I have them in Kentucky, yeah. in eastern, northeastern Kentucky. It's interesting. I guess I don't yeah. necessarily know why we don't have them. I mean, there's enough ag and stuff to what I would think would sustain them, but mm -hmm. yeah, there's well, not there. Basically, the prop. You know, these guys are forest animals, and so they need forests to survive. And mm. so it, you have to have a certain percentage <clears throat> and it can't just be little fry, little wood lots. It's got to be bigger blocks. Yeah. But bears, uh, give you an idea. There's eight species of bears in the world. There's about 1.2 million bears on the planet. Eight species. What percent of those 1.2 million global population do you think are no North American black bears? Eight species. Ooh, uh, in the whole world? In the whole world. Uh, 25%. That's a good guess. Anybody else? <laughs> Just throw a number out there. 75%. 75%. Are black, are the black bears in North America? Three quarters of all the, of all the bears on the planet are North American black bears. What are there? What wow. are the other? So polar, so in grizzly. North America, you have three species. You have black, American black bear. Yep. Brown bear, which includes grizzly and coastal brown. Okay. Yep. And then you have polar bears. Yep. Okay. So then you go to South America. You have the spectacled bear. It's just like a black bear, but it has like white, different markings. It's a different kind. It's a different kind of bear. It's more primitive, but okay. that's the spectacled bear. That's the fourth bear. And the other four are over in Asia, pretty much. You've got um, the Asiatic black bear, mm -hmm. the sloth bear in India. Mm -hmm. That's not you a have, not a sloth, right? It's a it's an actual bear called a sloth a bear. bear. Yeah. Okay. You have the moon bear, which is. Um, uh, Sumatra, say in Southeast Asia area, um, and the giant. You have the giant panda. The panda. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Panda's the one I was thinking of. Here's a stupid question for you. Koala's not a bear, right? No. It's a Koala, marsupial. I think it's a marsupial. Yeah. 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 So it's not, and it's you know it's a, a totally different animal. Yeah. That's amazing. The number of seventy five percent black bear. Yeah. Yeah, when I was a kid, you know, I never saw a bear until I became a bear biologist. I drove one into my dad in 1965 when I was um, 13 years old. He killed it. It was a yearling male with a big white chest blaze, I remember. Shot it in the chest I'm blaze. Sure, I'm sure that was like a parade like around town. 
Oh, it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. And now that place is just polluted with bears. There's bears all over the place in the Poconos and all over. Oh, yeah. Here's a PA mountain hunting story for you. We've got some buddies that this year, uh, this guy and his daughter shot a buck during, I want to say it's the archery season. It's like a nice buck. Um, I don't know, Elk County. Yeah, Elk County. County. It's Paul. Yep. He wounded it and the bear got it. Yep. And so they couldn't find it. And whatever it was, a couple days, week or so later, they it was, were yeah, it was they like were, over a week. They later. were bear hunting as a big group, and they I shot this bear and it ran into a cave or however that that happened. They shot this bear and went into the cave and found the buck. There it was, and so they have this awesome picture of there's like ten or fifteen of them standing around this this bear and this big buck head that was that yeah. was all that was left yeah. laying right there. Yeah. Pretty wild. They, yeah, they'll drag um, they'll drag a carcass into a protected area like that and. In the winter of 1978, so it was like, uh, it, was, it would normally be April, but um, the bears usually leave the dens uh, the last week of March, early April, like the mothers with cubs are the last ones to leave. But um, that year, it was May before they got out. We had so much snow that winter, and the the deer herd was way too high. <clears throat> they didn't have, they weren't in good shape to begin with. And with the deep snow and cold temperatures all winter, they had a massive die off. Yeah. And so when I was radio tracking my bears and went into the dens in the spring, those dens were all full of deer here. They went out <laughs> and pick up a carcass, drag it drag in. And it eat in. It. So yeah. I was working on bears every day. And every day when I was, I had a coveralls on, I'd come out, I'd look like a deer. I had deer hair all over me all the time. Wow. So yeah, they like to eat dead deer for sure. Gary, let me ask you a bear hunting question. <clears throat> Obviously, we know kind of the upper Midwest have, uh, in Canada, have spring seasons. Why not in yeah. Pennsylvania? It's just like everything else we talked about. What, how do you want to do it? Want to shoot them in the spring? Sure, we can shoot them in the spring. It's just to get to the number. It's culture. I mean, uh, the people's response is culture. I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, so if you talk to people in the South, it might have changed since you know, I did all this research. But um, we were looking at like the, what was called the cub law. It was not legal to shoot cubs. Mm. For most of our history. Yep. In 19, uh, but I started working on bears in 74 and I was seeing cubs in the fall around hunting season that get up, up to 140 pounds. Whoa. Hunters had no idea what the hell they're looking at. You know, it's they, a black speck in the mountain laurel. Yeah. We, we did, <laughs> yeah, in the thick cover. Yeah. And uh, we, we were always uh, having these people fined for shooting cub bears. And then I did a survey, like what, how many, well, how many bears have you seen? The hunters that actually shot bears, I, we asked them what percent or how many deer, how many bear cubs have you seen in your life in the <clears throat> yeah. wild? Yeah. Never. None. Never. Like there was like, I don't know what it was, 7% or something saw cubs in the wild. Yeah. It was like, and I, at that time I had already handled, you know, over a thousand bears. I shot darts into cubs thinking they were adults when I knew it was a mother with yearlings. And I thought it was one of the, when I say yearlings, it's just right after the first of the year. Right. You're out in on the open ground. I'm sneaking around and I kick them out and I fire and hit them with a dart and think, well, I got the mother. And you walk out and it's not the mother. It's just one of those big old yearlings. Well, they, they were cubs the month before that in the hunting yeah. season, they would have been, they were lighter then than they were when the hunters were out. Anyway, uh, I started to think about that and say, you know, I've handled more black bears than anybody around. And I'm making this mistake. Why are we finding people who right. never saw a bear in their life before? You know, this is something, this isn't right. And then people would be bringing them in and they would say, um, you know, hey, I'm really embarrassed. I made a mistake. I shot a cub. Um, could I take this around behind the building where nobody can see it and we can, I'll pay the fine. Sure. Let's yeah. do that. Go around the back, open the trunk. It's a legal yearling female, weighs 75 pounds. <laughs> wow. It's like. Jesus, this this wasn't like <clears throat> once in a while. This was happening all the time, every check station. And so then uh, I would go into court cases. The gang commission would say, you have to go in and defend this in court. So you go into court. The judge would say, what was he charged with? Say, shooting a bear less than a year of age. How did you know he was, you know, he's looking at this thing like this. Um, How did you know he was a yearling? <laughs> How did you know he was not a cub? And I said, well, his canine teeth were less than five-eighths of an inch erupted in, off the gum. And he's doing this. He's like looking over his glasses and says, <laughs> Looks at the guy and says, how is he sussing out how long the canine was when he shot it? <laughs> yeah. It was ridiculous. And uh, I made a pitch to change the cub law. I said, it's ridiculous. You know, we got to do away with it. But before I made my pitch, 
I looked at the laws all the way from Florida to the Eastern Canadian provinces. What I found was, to my shock, was Pennsylvania was unique from any other state. Every stout, every state to the south of us, um, cubs were not legal, and neither were the mother. A mother with cubs cannot be shot legally. In in uh, every state to the north of us, and even in, up into Canada, all bears were legal. Didn't matter. And so um, they might have had a weight limit, thirty pounds or right. fifty pounds, but there was no no thing like a cub law. Pennsylvania was the only state in the eastern United States and maybe in the country where um, cubs were not legal, but the mothers were. My argument to the commissioners, to the legislators and everybody else was, you know, I'm a bear biologist. I'm handled more black bears than anybody that I know of in the world. And I make this mistake not all the time, but I make the mistake a lot. It's right. easy to make. Yeah, and and I do a survey, and these guys have seen most of them. The vast majority of them have never seen a cub in their life. Many of them have never seen a bear in their life. And you go to court, and the judge asks you, you know, how old and how did you figure it out? I said that's just a really stupid answer to get. They they don't know. They don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and you don't know either. <laughs> and I said, you know, this needs to be done away with. And I said, you know, in the South. When cubs and mothers are not legal, either one, they're running them with dogs and they're treeing them and looking them over. It's not hard. In Pennsylvania, a lot of times, at then especially, they're putting drives on. They're putting oh, yeah. drives on. Pick them up, and they, they take off running and the cubs and the mothers get broken up a lot of times. Yeah. You got a single bear running around. Bam, bam, bam. I say, wow, it looked bigger in the scope. Yeah, Absolutely it did. <laughs> yeah. And so... I uh, made a plea which was incredibly unpopular because at that time we were worried about losing the bear. Yeah. And now this loony bear biologist wants to shoot the baby bears. You know, what's wrong with it? Like perverted. <laughs> and yet I, when I look at the thing, you divorce yourself from everything else, and you look at it and say it is not right to arrest or fine hunters for shooting a bear that he had no chance of knowing whether it was a cub or not. I mean – you just, or I shouldn't say no chance, but it's not yeah. realistic for them under Pennsylvania hunting conditions to be able to do it right. Mm. And it leads to a lot of bad feelings. We should go one way or the other. And I think we should let all bears be legal like all the northern states because we don't hunt them with dogs and shoot them out of trees where you can look them over. Sure. Worse than that, a majority of our bears at that time were being shot on drives. They're running by them really fast and the cubs are separate from the mothers. They've been broken up a lot of times. And so we should do that. And I was, oh, that was like, it wasn't as bad as the doe thing, but boy, the people hated me for that. And how could you support shooting baby bears? Well, I'm not supporting shooting baby bears. And actually, when I went into the commission, my boss, Gail Sheffer, was head of research. He said to me, we, they were going to vote on it. The board of commissioners was going to vote on it the next day. And they said, he said, hey, they had a meeting last night. This isn't legal any longer. <laughs> but so they had a meeting last night and they decided uh, they're not going to go along with you on this cub thing. And one of the commissioners was in the newspaper saying over my dead body because, you know, real hunters would never shoot a baby bear and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so I went in to the meeting and uh, he said, you're wasting your time. You lost the vote last night. You weren't here. You can go ahead and do your presentation, but you're the, dead. Yeah, decisions have been made. Yes, the decisions are made. So I was mad. Seems like I've spent a lot of my life mad. <laughs> so I, I had my slideshow set up for them, and I thought, I'm going to really give it to them, but I'm going to stop the slideshow at an opportune time, and then I'm going to hit them over the head with it in a minute. And so I started to show the pictures, and I, and I showed them, uh, you know, I talked about, you know, what was going on around the country and everything. And then uh, I said, I think the right thing for us to do is to uh, – change this regulation it wasn't a law it was a regulation so that all bears are legal it makes us consistent with all the other northern states it doesn't make sense for us especially that we drive bear and everything i just wanted to stick with the facts but i knew it would become emotional because just like with deer that's what happens yeah and so i left the projector running i just um shut off where he couldn't uh see the next slide and uh the chair the uh President of the commission stood up, was a friend of mine, was instrumental in me getting hired. He stood up and he said, as, as you all know, I really respect this guy who's studying bears here. But he says, uh, in this case, 
if he does, if we do what he recommends, it'll be the first major step to the extermination of bears in Pennsylvania. That's exactly what he said. Wow. And I jumped up, made a fist, and I pounded the table with a fist really hard. And I said, really, this is behind closed doors in the gang commission office. So I made a fist and I slammed, I hit the desk really hard within one second of when he said that. I jumped up, punched the desk and said, based on what? And it really caught him off guard. He started backing up. He, nobody expected me to do that. It was You would think it was disrespectful, but if you want to change things, you can't be shy. You've got to <laughs> know when to punch. And I, I hit him really hard with that. He was flabbergasted. One, that I did it, and two, that I did it to him because he yeah. was a friend of mine. Yeah. And uh, he stumbled around. He just said, uh, well, that's what I think. And I said, I know. But I said, that's not the way we ought to be managing bears in Pennsylvania. We need to do it based on facts, not on opinions. And I said, at this point, some of the people were really angry. Like, you can't do that to commissioner, basically. And I said, I said, I... Um, I just, if you would give me 30 seconds, I can demonstrate to you why I'm so emotional about this issue. And, he, and the president said, yeah, go ahead. So I turned the projector back on and I and advanced. And there it is. A mother. There's five bears in a picture. And I said, okay, it's bear season. Opening day. We just put a drive on. They're coming by. They just briefly stop. Perfect shot. Kill it. Which one's the one? What are you looking at? I said, do you have five legal bears or four of them cubs? Which one's the mother? Because the one big bear, you know, I said, oh, that's got to be her. And uh, and it had a collar on it, too, which was another clue for them. But um, they were foaming around. Nobody wanted to answer the question. I said, I said, are we looking at a mother and four cubs or a mother and four yearlings? No, nobody would answer the question. And I said, which one are you going to kill? I said, you are never going to have this much time to shoot a bear in the yeah, wild. Come on, somebody. Yeah, time's and the gone. one guy, one guy, one of the commissioners says, it's the one on the right. He picked the one with the radio collar on it. I know what he was thinking. The mother's collared. The cubs are not. Yeah. But you couldn't see. The real mother was walking away at an angle. She looked smaller. You couldn't see the collar. I had a collar on one of the yearlings. Two. When he picked the wrong one. And I said, right near him, in the room. I said, Jerry, I said, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Jerry. He's the head of uh, law enforcement. You owe, <laughs> you owe him $400. You just shot the wrong bear. Everybody started laughing. And I said, don't laugh. I said, you all could have shot that bear. Yep. And I said, I have done it myself. And that's why I'm so damn emphatic on changing this rule. It doesn't make sense. I said, let me show you some more. Boom, 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 boom. I kept showing pictures and doing the same thing. And it became obvious, like mm -hmm. nobody had a clue. And I said, this, I know we're concerned about shooting too many bears. I know it might be hard for the public to understand, but we know a lot more than what they know about this. And what is the right thing to do? The right thing to do here is to change this, to be consistent with the rest of the northern states mm. and not be trying to arrest people for doing things we can't even do ourselves. And we and we I, I going into the meeting, they said you lost at seven to one and coming out, I won at seven to one. Wow. And the guy who uh, voted against me was the guy who, um, you know, had the showdown with me. He saw me later and said, you know, if you were going to lose that vote today, I would have voted with you. But he said. I was in the newspaper like two days ago telling them why I want to come law. <laughs> wow. Hey, Gary, so that, that obviously seems, is very honorable, like from a, not wanting to find people where they had no, you know, means of, but from a, from a management standpoint, you know, you're saying that they were at risk of, you know, we're shooting too many bears. Like, um, did you, did you bring something to the table to say, well, here's how we're going to address this. Like I'm, I'm getting, I know I'm doing this, but here's what we're going to do. Yeah, I think, you know, in terms of managing bears, you have to keep your eye on the ball in terms of the total resource. And you look at the different ways you can do it and say what, what makes sense. For example, why don't we hunt them with dogs? It's because in Pennsylvania, most of our land mass is subdivided into such small parcels that when you uh, take a pack of dogs and put them on a, do a bear, they're going to cross many different yes. private landowners, unless you're in the middle of a state forest system or something like that. And so that's a recipe for disaster because then, you know, people who don't want bears shot are now having bears chased on their own property by right. dogs and that sort of thing. That would just be, uh, I think, unacceptable. Of course, again, that's up to the public. It's up to the hunters. But from a biologist standpoint, you'd be uh, negligent if you couldn't bring up why logistically this just doesn't make sense. So looking at the scenario and and uh, recognizing that I was like leading the charge on trying to increase the bear population in Pennsylvania, 
and here here I am recommending making it legal to shoot cubs. That looked crazy. It looked like it was incompatible. Like, yeah. has he lost his mind or whatever? <laughs> but when you had the time, and I wrote an article, I think it was it was entitled Pennsylvania's Cub Law Controversy. I, and I wrote it in Game News. And I said, here, here's the issue. And here's why you know, I'm in favor of of shooting all bears, because this does not make sense. And, uh, and I explained why. And um, the director of the agency who was against me on almost everything at the time, uh, he, he jumped for it. And uh, thought it was a great idea. And I'm like, that's odd. Wonder why that happened. And I found out when he was younger, he shot a cub by a mistake. <laughs> oh, wow. There you go. That's hilarious. And so emotionally, you know, he had been burned himself. He understood it well because he paid the price. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I had no idea. I didn't understand why he was really gung-ho. And uh, then I laughed later when someone says, and what you didn't know was he, he shot that's a cub. You know, a yeah. while back, I'm like, I just laughed. I said, "Well, good for him." It's, you know, it's good to. Um, it, but it, well, the reason I bring it up is, as a manager, there are times when uh, your response is totally counter to what the average person, in the public, would say. Like they thought he's, you know, he's saving the bears. He's bringing them back. We're having more. They're spreading. He's trapping and transferring bears. We try to bring bears in our area. Why in God's name would he ever support shooting baby bears? That's just crazy. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's peddled. You know, you you support shooting baby bears? No, I don't. But in the fall year, they aren't babies anymore, and you can't tell them apart. I right. can't. Neither can you. I, what? I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, just on the side, I can see, you know, I can see, like, as a, a, being a bear biologist being frustrating, you know, having come from a deer situation where you're like, boy, I wish these bear had antlers so we could – Put some sort of a restriction on. No, it. I I, I yeah. worked on bears first. I didn't get on deer until yeah two thousand to the year uh, September uh, no nineteen ninety nine September nineteen ninety nine. Mm. All this bear controversy was in nineteen eighty. I think so. That was twenty years before. So I guess I was gonna say Gary is like <clears throat> obviously not everybody, but a lot of the guys who are deer hunters in Pennsylvania bear hunted right so basically it's probably what all bear hunters are also deer hunters not all deer hunters are bear hunters when exactly. you Here, here's the statistic there roughly uh right very close to 90 percent of all licensed buyers are deer hunters yep there would be uh about 20 percent would be bear hunters. bear hunters okay so as you get as we get to that you know 2000 time period I mean, the, the bear hunting in the state of Pennsylvania was amazing, I would say, yeah. at that time for most of those people, right? Oh, yeah. Do you think that – did? do you think anybody acknowledged you as the bear biologist as you translated into that deer biologist from a public standpoint? Not necessarily oh, yeah. from a from a game commission, but from the public eye. Oh, most of the people in the public knew who I was. I had been on TV. I don't know. A hundred times or more, I'd been in Pennsylvania Game News. I'd been on radio so much during those 20 years. They knew who I was. That's part of the reason why I got picked because um, I think Ridge knew that I had a really strong relationship with the hunters. That was, mm -hmm. They supported me a lot. They're very happy with what happened to the bear situation. I think mistakenly, a lot of the people who favored me running the deer program was they thought that you know while I ran the bear program, the numbers of bears, you know, more than quadruple. Right. So they're thinking, wow, put him in charge of deer and the deer population will quadruple. Yep. No, yeah. I want to kill the deer. It's like, <laughs> what? You got yeah. to crazy? And so there was a lot of confusion about it um, and a lot of anger too. I mean, uh, people who were really adamant about deer hunting was like, why would you put a bear biologist in charge of a deer program? That's stupid. And uh, I don't, I make sense. Like, why would you? But yeah. the reason, of course, wasn't because of what I knew about deer. Although I was a biologist, and I knew plenty about deer. I'd put together um, a slideshow on the natural history of deer, not just deer in Pennsylvania, but across the world. It was really broad, you know, and get into physiology and all other kinds of stuff. But the public had no idea that I had any background in deer. And they were very, a lot of them were really angry mm. that the game commission would hire this bear guy to run a deer program. That makes no sense. And, uh, so I had to fight with that in the beginning, but the way I dealt with it is I had done a lot of uh, private, like I had researched the literature lots. Sure. I knew a lot about deer worldwide. 
And so when I met with them and we started to sell the deer program, you know, I had an hour, hour and a half lecture I would give in those public meetings where they're hot, when they're really mad. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to the issue to the last 15 minutes. It wouldn't, if you try to tackle that issue in the first 15 minutes, forget it. Yeah, they'd eat it. Yeah, they'd be all. They all they want to do is fight. Yeah. But you start out and say, you know, I would start out saying, you know, that hunting is very important to me and deer hunting, especially. I don't want to get this wrong, but, you know, we find ourselves in a situation here that's really grave. We've got to try and fix this or it could have consequences for the future. And then uh, when I would talk with them about global situation, like why do deer have antlers? Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I, I never thought about it. That's the average response. And so let's take a look at this. You know, if you look, if you want to know what, why deer have antlers, let's look at the deer that don't have antlers. So I showed him, I, and I went and I'm a professional photographer as well. So I went down to the natural museum in Washington, DC. I got purple velvet background, dynamic lighting, and I took these close-up photos of a skull of a Chinese water buck. Mm -hmm. These guys stand about 18 inches tall at the shoulder, and they have four and a half inch canines. Yep. You get a skull and you use a macro, move in and get a really nice tight shot of a Chinese water buck skull, and it looks exactly like a saber-toothed tiger. <laughs> so you can imagine this. you got a 1,000 people in an auditorium. It's like, why do deer have antlers? And everybody's looking at everybody else going, geez, that's interesting. I never thought about it. And I said, um, the answer to the question comes in looking at deer that don't have antlers. Here's what happens. I, and I show them this picture of this. It, you really think it's a saber-toothed tiger. And I said, that's not a saber-toothed tiger. That's a deer. That's a Chinese water buck. That's what happens when deer don't have antlers. The males have really large canine teeth. And then I would say, what does that have to do with shooting enough deer, saving the forest? He goes, nothing. What does it have to do with these hunters? Absolutely nothing. But what does it do? It pulls them away from this anger. I'm going to attack right. the first chance I get. It's like, what the hell? What is he talking about? And so you show them this picture. And I would say, why do you think they have antlers? Go through that routine. Then I would say, could you imagine if moose didn't have antlers? I said, God, they'd have 18-inch canines coming out of their mouths. I said, we'd send 18-inch <laughs> bow hunters out there, and only two of you would make it back alive. <laughs> and the, you know, a thousand people just roar with laughter. It's it's absurd. It's crazy, but it's funny. Yeah. What happens is, you know, how many times can you do that in an hour? If you can do that three or four times in an hour where people laugh really hard, when you're in an auditorium with a thousand people laughing really hard, it gets really difficult to attack the speaker. You yeah. know, let him talk. Give him a chance. Mm -hmm. He's funny, might not be smart, but he's funny and he believes in what he's doing. He believes in trying to fix this. Let him talk. And so that you win respect from the audience by going into these things. They've never heard of any of that stuff. And it's totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's the reason why you can change people's minds because you do that. And then you go in and show them other things, you know, unusual behavior patterns, um, you try to answer questions that they've heard about that they probably haven't ever heard an answer for. Um, and you have these just funny situations that happen that make them laugh a lot as you go through. And then at the end of an hour, you hold them in the palm of your hand. You mm. hold them in the palm of your hand. They just look at you and go, wow, geez, what is he going to say next? And when you're done at the end, you just say, listen, I wasn't sent here by divine intervention, <laughs> you know, I'm the same as you. I love deer hunting and I want to fix it. I happen to be in a position where I might have some uh, opportunity to improve it. That's what I want to do. I'm going to make mistakes, but hang in there. We'll we'll get it right over time. And I would explain, you know, we're launching these really large studies. We're learning things and we're not looking at what happened in Texas in the 1920s. We're showing you what's happening in Pennsylvania right now. Mm -hmm. and we're using that information to make the right choices for all of us in the future. They trust you at the end of an hour. They, you made them laugh. You gave them the gee whiz stuff. Now they're ready to hear the truth about where, why are we here? What are we trying to do? You climb down into the issue. And that's when you get really humble and just say, you know, I don't have the instruction book on how to fix this. I have a team of very experienced people that are talking to me. And I'm here talking to you and listening to you. What do you want us to do? And I have to make, and the whole team has to make a choice, a decision about how to fix this for all of us, not just for me or my team. And you could hear a pin drop when you go through that. And the last thing I would say, oh, the other thing I should tell you is every commissioner and every legislator that gave the gang commission trouble, I want to know their names 
and the contact information. Well, they knew that actually they knew the names and contact. I needed it from them and said, get them to sponsor these public meetings. And when they sponsor them, these huge crowds would show up. That's their constituents in their district. Right. And I, I want to be able to show them. And I would, you know, talk, they would introduce me. Usually the legislator would sponsor the meeting, introduce me, and they would sit in the front row. And I would tell them ahead of time, I'm going to talk for an hour, hour and 15 minutes. When I'm done, I'm going to ask your constituents, would you be willing to support the changes in deer management that I've covered tonight? Would you be willing to support it? Raise your hand. You know, thousand people in a room, 850 of them raised their hand. That's the end of that. Yeah. That's the game over. That. It's wow. all game over. Yeah. It's like, holy cow. And then you go to the next town you go to the next legislator and you just keep moving around the state at that point. You know, you've made them laugh. You've won their respect. You ate their crowd in front of them. And it's like, let them do it. Let them do it. It's really hard to do. But if you can do that, you can have, you can make things happen that never could happen before. That was my contribution. I knew how to deal with a crowd and how to, how to get them to listen and to get them to give us a chance. I wouldn't have known what to say if I didn't have the team behind me. That was my contribution was that and being um sometimes inappropriate for a state employee i was really rough but you can't go in front of a thousand hunters and say gee golly gosh this guys do you think you could work with me on this no i can't get out of the room you know you have to earn it you have to warn the respect on their turf kind of being a little gruff like they are yeah i'll tell you what it you know <clears throat> to be honest gary i think it's fairly needed in in deer management across the country today um because yeah. you you don't hear i you know obviously you, you've done what you and the team did changed pennsylvania deer hunting uh for as, as long as we may know it moving forward yeah. um barring any kind of major you know disease outbreak or whatever i think that why it also stands out to people outside of the state of Pennsylvania. And people know who Gary Ald is outside the state of Pennsylvania because it, nobody else has done it. Nobody's done any kind of campaign like what you guys did in the early 2000s. And I think there's plenty of issues in a lot of states that deserve it. So I hope you're ready. We're calling you out of retirement <laughs> to come fight corn piles in Ohio. So I hope you're coming with us. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a you know what I'm saying though, Gary. It's a yeah, we kind of had this discussion of like there. Well, we're know. looking at this. Try we're just soaking it all in. How do we the the thing that's I don't know frustrating and concerning like from our end is like it seems like you know your experience was it happened because it was from the top down. The governor had an issue. He yes. wanted to resolve it. You figured out how to leverage hunters to yeah. fix the problem. Yeah, we're we're not the governor, right? And the governor doesn't care about the hunter's issues in this case, in our, you know, cases that we want to have addressed. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we're, we're still left. Like, I don't know. How does that happen from the bottom up? What has to happen? Well, well I think it's a yeah. different, different States are different. You know, if you look at Pennsylvania, it's probably the most difficult state in the country. I think Michigan, Wisconsin are right behind us. Um, if you look at the history of deer management in those States, it's, it's almost identical where um, they had really a large deer populations, you know, historically um, colonization. Then you have um, conversion of uh, most of the forest land to agriculture and all the forest species disappeared or were seriously reduced. And then um, there was a time uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when they were stocking deer or trying to find ways of bringing them back, giving them additional protection. And in all of these states, it's the northern part of the state, New York, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. You know, they're all the same. Yep. People live in the south, the wild countries in the north. That's where the forest didn't get clear cut and the better soils to the south that was all converted to agriculture. And um, in in all these states, too, some of the northern part got converted. But because the soils were so poor, they couldn't make a living on it. And by the late 1800s, early 1900s, they walked away from the land. They couldn't raise enough mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, things on farming to be able to make it. They just walked away and didn't pay the taxes. That's why the state owns so much of that land in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, New York. Oh, Pennsylvania. Wow. Well, not New York. New York 
is different with the Adirondack Park and the Catskills. That was done in the late 1800s and they just bought it up. That was for forest conservation. But anyway, um, the big states for deer, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, very similar. And so what happened? Those people in the South didn't have any deer where they lived. Mm -hmm. Their fathers and their grandfathers went north. They built camps in the north country. And it was an annual tradition that was sacred. It was just sacred. You know, that was the core thing they wanted to do every year and still. And so um, you it's hard to deal with that. It's like it's like as if it's a religion or a belief system when they uh, grandfather to a grand to a son to a grandson. And, and the history is long. The tradition is strong. Yeah, it's some of the best days of the year. It's it's hard to toy with that. Nobody wants government in the middle of that. And so mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to deal with it. There are other places in the United States, the Midwest, for example, where the heyday of deer, is, we're just coming off it. Really, yeah. the deer exploded in some of those states in the 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. And it's starting, it's starting to go the other way. Why did it happen? Why did we have this explosion of deer in Pennsylvania and these Wisconsin and Michigan? Because a lot of that, uh, marginal habitat for deer for um, agriculture they abandoned it when they did through forest regeneration yeah. it just came back when it came back it came back and put, supplied a lot more habitat for forest species deer bear turkey grouse you know where before it was just agriculture right uh, midwest they're just they went through an explosion when they first got deer re you know reestablished but then now they're seeing things go down a little bit. I think part of it too is they're hunting them a lot. They're hunting them a lot. Certainly the bucks, they're hunting a lot harder than they had been. The demand for shooting big bucks in the Midwest has really exploded, and it's getting harder and harder for those guys. Like even in the Golden Triangle and everything else, you know, in Illinois. Yep. You have to you have to slow down the shoot. You can't shoot your buck and have it too. And so. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting what, to see a slip in the other way now yeah, in some of those states think, that we're known that, for. Yeah. To answer your question, though. I think that there is no single solution that's right for all the states. You have to look at the history of the state, what's going on there. I do think that it makes sense to um, whoever's going to sell this needs to not just talk about the issue because I think they're so entrenched in their decision, you can't get at them. And this mm -hmm. mental picture that I had when I did these presentations, I did it with bears too, but uh, you come there and, you know, hi. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I thought I didn't trust you. Now I really hate you. Yeah. And so, you know, so if you come and you're non-traditional, you come in and you're a little, you know, you're not really predictable and, and you can make them laugh and give them information, but they still feel like this guy seems to be like me in that he really loves wildlife and he wants this hunting to continue. They trust you. And, Every time you make them laugh really, really hard or you tell them something, gee whiz, it's like I think of a zipper that goes right around the brain. And so and it's locked. You can't get in at all. And so then you say, uh, you start talking, you make them laugh. It's like zip, just a little bit opens. Oh, yeah. That's funny. And then another laugh, it unzips a little more. Then you start really getting into things you believe in and you're pitching hard and they want you to do it. It just opens right up. The top flips over and it's like, what do you want to plant? Yeah. It's yours. It's fertile. It's wide open. And you just start putting stuff in there. Like we think this is the right thing to do. Be careful. Don't lie. Be honest. You know, if you ever say something that they don't trust, it's yeah, shut it. It's not going to open again. Up. Yeah. Wow. And it's, it's kind of like a mental, I always thought of it. That's the way I thought of it. And it's amazing. You can go into a room that's almost violent with a thousand people. And at the end of an hour, you hold them in the palm of your hand and say, oh, my God, be careful because be careful that what you're asking for is the right thing. Hmm. Because, you know, there's plenty. The world has had a history of people that were very good at getting large numbers of people to follow them. We know their names and they're not held in high esteem. Sure. These are people that that used it wrong, you know, improper yeah. use of that set yeah but if you want to change deer management that would be or anything i think that's the strategy i would use but you better have a good motive and you better see, keep it clean hmm. you know you know if you try and sell stuff or something like that they know you're trying to sell stuff you're not going to get in it's like sure. why are you here 
Sure. But yeah. if you're with them talking about something they believe in and they think you're one of them and you're believing it too, only you have the possibility of actually improving it. Then they start saying, yeah, maybe let's give this guy a chance. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch. But, yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are a are major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm -hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20, that's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. Yeah, it's interesting because it is similar to your situation in that like it's it seems like there's uh, – a misunderstanding or uh, of, of the consequences. It's like, you know, people don't want to give up. Like in the state of Ohio, it's, it's corn piles. You know, Jeremy and I address that issue as something we think is like the, is going to cause a large drop off of the number of hunters, like a, a large, yeah. um, you know, c cancellation of, of the culture of like, you know, what hunting is. It's just like, we have a yeah. whole generation of people who rely on corn piles to hunt in Ohio. Yes. yes. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, <laughs> so many times I have people uh, come up and they sit up to the microphone and they would say, in 1967, I shot a really nice eight point buck off this tree stump or this rock uh, out there in the woods. I have hunted there for decades. I've never had another chance. It's like, and uh, my question is, I just lean forward and say, why do you keep going there? And the crowd <laughs> would just laugh. Yeah. And I said, you know, there's a lot more to hunting than just going out and sitting in the woods. Yeah. I'll have fun sitting in the woods, but if you want to kill a deer, you better start looking around and figuring out where they are. Why are they there? You know, look for pinch points, sure. look for uh, travel corridors. You know, what are they doing over in here? There should be, you should be able to rattle off five reasons why you're standing where you are, which way is the wind blowing mm -hmm. and uh, you know, where's your best view, you know, anyway, uh, you talk with them about stuff like that, but people get mad and say the darndest things like that. I forget why I'm saying that to you right now. Well, I was mentioning the corn piles and like, so oh, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. The, the people yeah. of Ohio are very tied to, they're like, well, this is how we do it. This is how yeah. we've always done yes. it. Yes. Well, if you go back to my grandfather's days, he was born in the late 1800s. And uh, in the 1920s, he used to go to Pike County, yep. big woods county. And they would get on a set of tracks and they track the damn thing for multiple days and they'd walk it down and kill it. <laughs> wow. How many guys do you know in Pennsylvania today that do that? You know, it's just, right. there are some nah, of my try. Yeah, but not many. Not many. But um, I think, you know, from my perspective, and I wish we could put the hunt back in hunting, the people I admire, the people who hunt public land, state land, or federal land, the Allegheny National Forest, something like that. They go out in there and they just scout like crazy and they really get to know the terrain. They look where the pinch points are and over time they learn where the travel corridors are, what to expect under different conditions, whether the oaks are producing acorns or not and or whatever, or they're eating beech or something else. Um, people with a lot of uh, natural history experience, they know the wild really well. And they're willing to really work hard at it. When you allow deer herds to get to, you know, 70 deer per square mile as they chew their way through all the vegetation, people get lazy. I mean, that's the natural state in wild or in uh, people. You've got to do it the easiest way you can. Most do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you have that, when you have that situation going on, uh, you can pretty much predict how they're going to do it. And so if you can put bait out, how much skill do you have to have to shoot a deer over bait compared to getting on a set of tracks and tracking it down and killing, for example? Right, right. 
there's a big difference between that. And so what I think the disaster was is that when d densities of deer got so high, when they weren't managed properly, people got lazy and they started just picking stands, whether it be at the base of a tree or later on climbing up into a tree stand. And they want to shoot a deer out of that tree stand opening day. That's what they want. Right. Mm -hmm. they don't. They're mad. Yeah. And it's not realistic. You know, yeah, when you got 80 deer per square mile, you can, you know, have to go out there with 15 hunters and come back with 12 bucks. But when the density starts to drop, it's going to get lower and lower. And it was, it does. Those people get madder and madder. And they don't understand why the deer aren't there anymore. They just don't get it. Hmm. That's our perspective exactly. You know, you talk about, uh, I think it's it's the failure and it's the struggle that really inspires somebody to, you know, fall in love with the, the sport of hunting. And our fear with things, you know, like corn piles, you know, you could point to any technology that makes hunting easier. Cell cameras, is that, whatever. That is the experience. So you look at a younger generation of hunters and if it's like, you know, all I know is that, you know, I can hunt now and I'll, as a 10 year old, I go out as a 10 year old and I can shoot a big buck over a corn pile with a straight wall right, rifle that dad's been watching with a cell camera for, for a year. And yep. okay. Yeah. You had that early success, like the, the, uh, you know, the, the itch was scratch, you're satisfied there, but like. How does that, how does that manifest, you know, a lifelong hunter, you know, th like the, the continuation of the culture is like what, what we're fearful will erode with the continuation of these practices. Yeah. I think it's the experience that makes it happen. It's the culture. And, uh, how did you feel when you were hunting with your grandfather and your father and your son all at the same time? Yeah. You come back to a cabin somewhere, the things that happen at the cabin in terms of sitting around a fire and talking. There's nowhere else you can get that. And yeah. when they pass away, that's all you have left is the memory. And you can't scratch the itch anymore. You can't find anything else that will quite do it. I think that's that's the desire that you see really prominent in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania is the, the camps, the hunting camps up on state property, basically. Definitely. And what happened to those people when they – what exacerbated it in all three of those states is that when they first <laughs> built those camps, when they're – ancestors whether it be grandfather or father or whatever great grandfather uh when they built those camps or put them together and started using them um uh, there were no there were no deer at home <laughs> there were no deer or very very few deer you wouldn't think about hunting them in the southern part of those states if you want to shoot a deer you got to go north you got to go up into the 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 big big woods big country woods. Mm -hmm. and that's where those experiences happen you couldn't do it at home All and right. so you were able to do something there you couldn't do at home. And I think it created a culture of people that not just shooting the deer, driving up there and all the preparation, all the things that go into it. And the and when you did get one, it was so special. They'd hang it up on a meat pole. We all seen pictures of that and other people. I don't know if you can see back here, Gary. Or yes, not. I can. Exactly. That's a, that's a mountain buck that Jeremy shot that the four of us made a memory just like that. And it's hanging, yes. hanging from a buck pole. I know. Yeah. And that's when that happens, it's almost like a religion. People just they just cherish it. It's one of the highest things in priority in their lives. I'm not saying it should be, but it is. I preach it to the choir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get it. We hide it with, so, hold it with high regard. So whenever you're trying to bring it back or change it or toy with it in any way, it's really hard because those people want to do it the way they did it before. Yeah. And if you start changing the rules, like uh, let's do it with crossbow because I don't, you know, longbows are ridiculous and recurves aren't much better. And uh, the old compounds that were better than the others, but boy, these crossbows are really something. Mm -hmm. It's a different experience entirely. And for the people who did it the old way, they just roll their eyes and fiercely don't want to be around it at all. Mm. But we change over time, whether it be in changing the techniques, like with, uh, different, more modern uh, weapons that are more likely to kill a deer, you know, easier to get a deer, or whether you start implementing bait or things like that, it changes the formula all around. You got to watch out from the baiting standpoint in terms of uh, concentrating deer in areas, which increases the ability of diseases like chronic wasting disease to change, sure. to move through the herd faster, stuff like that. There are other consequences to think about, but yeah, it's it's complex. It's difficult. But I think, you know, what's most important is to understand what's driving the system. Why do these hunters behave the way they behave? And if you have a chance to move around the country, you'll see differences. And then, but if you want to figure out why 
some of them are so angry about today. You need to talk to them about what was it like a hundred years ago? Where did your great grandfather hunt, your grandfather and so on? How did they do it? And you often you'll find that they're settled back in the 1970s or earlier. Um, that's what they're fixated on. Right. And their parents were fixated in the 1920s, mm -hmm. you know, and well, grand, great, great, great grandparents. So it's, it's a tradition. And, uh, and over time, it changes. But when you think about this stuff, it's like, you know, I I can sympathize with what you're saying. Where do you draw the line? What is the right way of doing it? What's How can we come out of this where we have, um, we can maintain hunting in the United States, deer hunting in a way that can be uh, sustainable, can go on for a long time. Yeah. Well, so it's, t it's tough because I think a lot of the, you know, the people who, you know, give hunters that stuff, it's like... Uh, they want, they want it, right? Like we, you know, we want the easiest path to killing yeah. a big buck basically. And, yeah. you know, and we, you know, I, I, you know, in a way we do too, like, man, I want to kill a big buck. Mm -hmm. Like I, who do who do, wouldn't want that. But yeah. I think we're just aware of the slippery slope that the, the easier you allow for it to be for somebody, the less love for the sport is going to exist. The less, you know, mm -hmm. you, does that the make sense? The more opportunity doesn't necessarily equate to l l more hunters yeah. over the long term. And so we basically yeah. assume the position of hunters are mad at us. They're like, well, what do you mean? We, you know, you're dividing us. Like you're, you know, that you don't want crossbows. And I'm like, listen, I'm not, I'm not, I don't care what you shoot it with. I don't care if you shoot it over bait, like from a, a pure, purist standpoint, I don't care about any of that. I care about the resource and the future of hunting as like a culture for us to be able to do it and still love yeah. it. I see yeah. that dying as we continue to make it easier. You know, most people who think about that are uh, twice your age. Mm. Yeah, we're old but souls. Jeremy's about twice my age. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it uh, it makes me feel good to see people your age who are really uh, interested in trying to fix that. Because by the time you're my age, uh, you can see it. You've lived through a lot. You've really you've seen it with your own eyes, like how it's changed so drastically in your lifetime. But you get less and less power as you get older. They don't take you serious. We're not in China where they revere older people. <laughs> you become invisible, really. And uh, so it's for me, it's exciting to see people at your age with your desires to fix it. You have a better, much better chance with your modern technology to work with. You're, you're more the age of the people who are involved. And if you can change the minds of the people who are young like you guys are, that's the future. That's why we do this podcast, Gary. I mean, it, yes. it, this, this yeah. podcast and these discussions, we're, we're not right on everything we talk about, but discussion. Oh, we're and, funny and we're talking about yeah. it and minds are open. <laughs> that's that's the whole point, right? Is at least yeah. to, just enjoy a discussion with us about it. And whatever yeah. you decide at the end of it is is your right to have that decision. But we're, we're going to talk about it and we're going to try to make it funny and we're going to try to enjoy yeah. it along the way. And, and if it, along the way, yeah, we can we can we can preserve, you know, the, the future of hunting mm -hmm. for, you know, for our kids and for, we're too young. I'm too young to see it go to, I'm 30 years old, Gary. And yeah. that's what I've said. I'm like, dude, I'm too, I'm too young. I've got too much deer hunting ahead of me. Like I might have kids someday. I want them to experience it. I'm not going to yeah. just sit by and let it get so easy to the point that the culture dies. And it's like, well, why, why, yeah, why would you do that? So I can just go, it's easy. Anybody can. And I struggle. My kids are at hunting age and yeah. I'm struggling in I'm the community for your kids too. of like, I know how I want them to hunt and I, I manage it that way, but their, their friends are, you know, out killing deer pretty easily all the time. And it's like, yeah. You know, how tough do I make it for them to where they love it, but they don't lose interest? Yeah. I'd have to think about that a while because I've heard those discussions in uh, those meetings that I had and stuff. And the, basically they said if, if those kids don't get a deer, they'll quit hunting. I'm not sure that's true. I think it's, it's not the opposite. Always, brother, it's, it's like, what was the experience? Yeah. Like when I, I hunt with my son, it's the greatest thing we do together. Yeah. We just, you know, last month we spent uh, nine days hunting in Illinois. Yeah. And um, we do it every year. Now we go out, we'll have one farm that's ours. There's three of us hunt there now. We were on a, a bigger farm with more people, you know, for the six years or so before that. But <clears throat> it's just my son and I and his best friend. And my son and I go out. We, I can fly in from California. He flies from Pennsylvania. We meet in Chicago 
we arrive with a fistful of trail cameras in, in <laughs> September. Mm -hmm. So we go out there in mid September, late September, and uh, we switched farms. This year was the first time we're on this new farm, and so we're just, you know, like the anxiety. And I shouldn't say anxiety; that sounds negative. But my anticipation for success in the early days when I was a kid hunting and stuff. It's different. I know a lot more about it. And I do really, and so does my son, just love coming in on a new piece of ground and say, can I figure out how this works? And yeah. can I find one of these guys later? Yeah. And who is here? Who does live here anyway? And I find for me that getting the deer is, is not the climax anymore. The climax for me is setting out the trail cameras and scouting the land. Mm -hmm. Like what is going on out here? Yep. And we're, we're, what do you think they're doing? Mm. They have so much food. It's not like they're going to come to bait. Jesus, they're swimming in food. There's a sea of it. Yep. Unless you want to give them something different that might help, you know. But um, we don't, obviously, we're not feeding anything. We just look at the deer sign and try and figure out where we want to be. But we're, rather than just shooting the gun and going over and gutting the deer and taking it home, for me, the highlight of this is the moments I spend with my son He's an executive now. He got a degree, undergraduate degrees in physics. And then he got a graduate degree in engineering. And he works for a pharmaceutical company. And so he's really, really, he's pretty far up in the pharmaceutical country, a company. He's um, 45 years old. Um, I took him hunting. I, I remember I used to go to New Jersey and shoot a boatload of deer over there with a bow in the eighties and I'd shoot a deer hour and a half from home. And I would get in my car and race back to Pennsylvania, load up my 10 year old son, go back to New Jersey, show him where I shot it and say, find the deer. That's awesome. Find the deer. Hmm. And I was here and he was standing just the side of that hemlock out there. Uh, I'll direct you to it. Okay. Right there. That's where I saw him last and mark the spot. Look for blood, follow the blood trail. That was unbelievable. When he was 10 years old, I was more than a half mile from Bob McDowell was the executive director for New Jersey Fish and Game later, but he was a biologist then, I think. And uh, we were hunting together right behind his house on some state land, Bear Swamp, it was called in New Jersey, lots of deer. And uh, I was shooting does primarily, but there I would get a buck, you know, every other year or so, but I was mainly just trying to get venison over there. But I went. I took my son with me. He was ten years old, and we climbed up on the top of this hemlock tree. <clears throat> we were up there until it was just getting dark. And I said, "It's really a stupid thing for a parent to say." Just to let you know how heartless I am. <laughs> I said to my ten-year-old son, "If I fell out of here and broke my back, and I couldn't walk, <laughs> could you, could you go back to the car and save me?" That's a great question, though. And he started crying, and I thought, "Well, that was stupid." <laughs> And I said, uh, he didn't cry long, but I said, I want you to, I don't want you to follow around behind me. I want you to be thinking all the time. Yep. I want you to know where we went and I want you to know why I'm here. And if anything happens to me, as young and little as you are, I want, I know you can do it. I just want to show you how to get out of here yep. and get back here. And so what I did was I said that to him and he said, okay, it was getting dark out. And I said, here's what I'm doing. I'm walking on this trail. Notice this trail. I'm just walking on this trail. I come to this logging road. Follow the logging road till you come to the boulder. When you see this boulder on the right, you turn left and head up past that white pine. And then you go down over the other side. You're going to hit a stream. And there's a place on the stream where you can cross. And then, you know, you know how it is when you're going cross country like that. And it was, you know, half a mile back to the car. Now, the car was near my buddy's house. So you would have actually gone. It's not about getting the car. It would be getting help, getting back to Bob's house, Bob McDowell's house. And uh, he started crying when I, when I talked about it all the way back. Here's what I'm doing. I said, tomorrow morning, we're going to come out here before daylight. And I want you to take me back to the stand. I told him I was going to do that before we even started, before we started coming back out of the woods. Mm -hmm. And I, there isn't one chance in a thousand he could ever do it. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> the next morning, we drove back to New Jersey and let him out. And he took me a half a mile right back to my stand. And he said, this is the hemlock. This is the logging road. He, he just in reverse order. Took you back to the tree and said, oh, my God. And for me, 10-year-old kid is like, we are hunting. This kid yeah. gets it. Wow. And so then and I took him back over and over and over tracking deer that I wounded. He's a 
he's way better than I am at tracking deer. He's got much better vision. He thinks about all this stuff. And that's what I go for. And when I, he and I go out with those cameras and we set them up, you know, 30 minutes after we put the first camera up, ding, ding, ding on your cell phone. It's like, oh my God, here's one here. Here's one there. You have a map of the area and we are entertained for two months. That entertainment is worth more than the hunt used to be worth. Now you've got all the entertainment. And when you sit out there, you say, is that curly? You know, is that yeah. the big 10? Is this the smaller eight? Is this the <laughs> non-typical so-and-so? And and when they show up, the second you see him, you just start giggling and say, oh my God, there he is. I've seen him on camera before a number mm -hmm. of times. And so it's the actual killing the deer isn't the, you know, it's still very, very exciting. But But whether you get a deer or not, you have all this excitement coming in for 60 days. It just yeah. goes on and we on. Get so it. Like for a day we, we get it. We get it. Jeremy and I bought a farm in Illinois. We'll talk afterwards, but maybe not far from where you're at. Uh, our first yeah. farm together bought it this past year, and we lived all of that. Like this this year, the excitement wow. was the first time going out there, just the excitement of – you know, uh, of getting on it for the first time. And we ended up killing three mature bucks off of it this yeah. year. So we were like, st we're like, dude, yeah. we got to fit. We figured it out pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> My son and his best friend and I shot, we shot three bucks as well. Wow. Yeah. We got, but they were, we didn't see anything over 140. And all three of our bucks were between 135 and 138. So it was almost like ours too. Yeah. Ours too. We Great. shot a bunch of yeah. mature, low scoring deer. And yep. to your comment about dad and son is our dads were with us. My dad was oh, with really? me in the stand mm -hmm. when I shot the second one, and Jeremy was with his dad. And I mean, I'm sure they heard the shot and stuff yeah. just over the hill. So, yeah. Oh god, pretty, cool. pretty awesome. Yeah, well, Gary, we we took a bunch of your time up, sir, and we greatly appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, we're just we're just in the first half hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first segment, first three hour segment here. We tell people all the time, we're like, listen, once you get into this thing, you know, we, we may say, hey, we need two or three hours, but like. It, it feels like it goes fast when you're in a good discussion and just quality yeah. discussion, like, you know, time flies and yeah. that's, I really appreciate you taking the time to, I'd just like to say one yeah. thing before I leave. And that yeah, is absolutely. just because I, just because I say something doesn't mean that's the way it is. Oh I mean, yeah. That's what I think it is. Yeah. And so some of these things I'm, I might be on some of them, I might be off, but it, that's my best shot at your answering your questions. Yeah. And uh, there's other people out there that know a lot more about this stuff than I do. But at well, least I gave you my opinion and what and I And that's think. what we ask for because that that at the end of the day, this podcast is to have these discussions. It's to have multiple guests on with differing viewpoints. I mean, that that's what at least Jared and I are chasing right now from a yeah. you know, yeah. a, a discussion around deer hunting and deer management and, and varying viewpoints because we, we're just naturally curious about them. Yeah. Well, in the future feel free to get a hold of me uh, if you're interested in anything to talk about again, deer, bear, photographing absolutely. wildlife around the world, whatever. We absolutely will, Gary. Yeah. But yeah, we, we greatly appreciate your time and, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people that really, really enjoy this podcast. Good. Well, um, yeah, I don't know if I have your contact information. I'd like to have it if I could. Yeah, I'll send it to you. I'm going to send you my thesis stuff too. We talked about my uh, using the trail camera pictures to score an age, and I know that you and your son are doing a bunch of that stuff. So I'll send yeah, it we over. Are. So you yeah, have we it. actually took, we estimated bucks, and then we we shot them. We have <laughs> uh, we have previous estimates, and now we hold the antlers in our in our hands, and uh, we were within about three points. There you go. Uh, Three, three to five points uh, on all three of the bucks that we shot. And there were a couple others that other guys shot. Pretty cool. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. It, but I mean, we had multiple shots. We had maybe 20 or more photos of these guys from different angles. So you really knew yep. what was on the head. Like yeah, the yep. one I got had 14 points. You wouldn't see it all at one spot. And unfortunately, you know, he was he was actually only three and a half years old. But um, uh, he it was a shame, really, that that buck. Oh God! What would he be? At five and a half? You know, that's the game, Gary. That's the game. So wait, we're going, we're um, going seven point on a side restrictions at this point. Uh, yeah. yeah. Next yeah. time we'll talk about like minimum one hundred and fifty, you know, restrictions. So yes, exactly. Well, if you can't, well, Gary, do you text? I'm, I'm sorry. I know. You're yeah, not, I text, you're not yeah. that old. If you text Jeremy no, some got, pictures, I've got his contact. We'll reciprocate some stuff. of our Illinois deer and stuff, and it'd be fun. Yeah, that's great. Oh yeah, I I mean I love hunting in Illinois. I just like I'm away from home. Derek's away from home. 
He's not distracted by other stuff. We just bond like crazy when we're out there. It's my favorite time. Yeah. I love hunting in Pennsylvania too, but th that's my favorite out there. Just yeah. Yeah. Like well, truthfully, it's, it's, uh, it's my escape, our escape, I guess, from Ohio, which is a, is a great state. And I'm not, I'm not complaining. That's for my, yeah, yeah. most of our stuff is that, but it's, it's a bait state and there's a lot of movement that's influenced by that. So one of the main things that drove us to yeah. Illinois was chasing mature deer on natural movements. Yes. Yeah. And so that's where we landed. That's, yeah. That's fabulous. Well, Hey, good luck to you guys. All right, thanks, Gary. We really appreciate it, man, and and thanks for for coming on. And we hope you guys have a great Christmas as well. Well, I have a great life. I'm not worried about Christmas that much. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I'm already thinking about next November. <laughs> there, yeah, us too, us man. As well, <laughs> us as well. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. All right, Thank yes, you, sir. Gary. Appreciate we'll it. it. And Gary Alt. Very cool. Pretty freaking awesome. You know, I I, I, uh, I hope that a lot of people listening to this who are not from Pennsylvania are not familiar with Gary. Do a little bit of research on it. Um, it it's it's a cool story. I mean... He's a legend around here. Well... I mean, to, to guys in their 40s and 50s in the state of Pennsylvania, like, you, yeah, they know. Like I said, I mean, I was in high school at these meetings that Gary was holding. I mean, it, it kind of shaped where I went uh, in college, what I did in college. I think what's important about it, though... And, and I guess scary in the same way is like nobody has ever made as big of a campaign and mission than Gary Alt. And it's been 20 years in deer management. That's not, I'm not just saying in Pennsylvania, I'm talking about like in the whitetail. Range. I know. Yeah, like where has that been? Where's that ever happened? Where's, where's there ever been a situation like what happened with the antler restriction in Pennsylvania? I mean, maybe, I mean, we could talk to Eberhard about like crossbows in Michigan, I think was a big well, deal, but, see, but it was the other way. They were lobbyists. We were losing ground. Lobbyists were forcing these things. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying is like, where, where did the state say, Hey, we have to make a significant Stand up for change. what's right. We're going to have to tell these hunters what is right. They don't know what's right. You as a group of hunters don't know what's right. We're going to have to tell them and we're going to have to convince them of what's right. You don't see that anywhere. It's lobbyists and legislatures doing things behind closed doors, and then, boom, by the time we hear about it, we've talked about it with drones, we've talked about it with crossbows, we've talked about it with baiting, the decision's been made. You can go to these hearings. We can talk about these hearings. The decision's already been made mm -hmm. from the lobbyists down. Mm -hmm. So it it's not existed, and I feel like that there's a lot of different places. You hear rumblings in Illinois. You hear rumblings in Ohio. Like, there are a lot, you hear rumblings in Kansas with a baiting ban. Like, all of a sudden, there are all these things happening where it's like, who's going to who's gonna be the Gary Alt of those situations? And I don't know what the answer is to that. Yeah. Well, and it's a different issue. I mean, we kind of talked circles around there for a little bit, but it's like, his was top down. Like, the governor of Pennsylvania was worried about, I'm sure there was some financial incentive to say... Uh, yeah, I mean, the timber production in with, the state of Pennsylvania. Exactly. And so, the way to address that was to, you know, rally hunters to kill more deer. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, Gary, I think, seized that as an opportunity, seized is what I said there, as an opportunity, yep. not seized, yep. that as an opportunity to, like, make, you know, give up uh, Pennsylvania hunters an opportunity to shoot bigger bucks. Mm -hmm. And so he felt like fully embraced that. And that was ultimately the outcome. You know, this is a situation now where we see universally, it's, it's more of a, a hunter culture, more of a hunter dynamic issues where, sure. where hunters are saying, just like we're saying, well, we're going to shoot all the deer is would have been what they said in Gary's time. We're saying we want all the tools. We want to shoot, you know, we want crossbows. We want corner pies. We want all this stuff. The reality is we want a great hunting experience. Like regardless of, uh, you know, what size deer we shoot or, mm -hmm. you know, any of all of the above, the reality is like we're, we're working our against ourselves by fighting to keep these, you know, increased technologies and stuff. And I just, I think a lot of our conversation, I hope is bringing light to that. I like those things too. They're fun. <coughs> I, I get it. Yeah. The, the big thing that I think of coming out of here and we've heard it from Rex and we've heard it, we talked about it with Kansas and baiting. We've talked about it with cell cams. We've talked about it with a lot of different things, straight wall cartridges. The fact is, is what Gary and his team implemented in Pennsylvania was much greater of a change than any of those things, sure. right? Not once did he say, we were worried about losing hunters, Jeremy. Right. Didn't ever come up. And I think if you look at the numbers, hunter numbers probably were already slightly declining, but I don't think it, there was no cliff. Like when these changes yeah. came into place, well, the, the, people didn't walk off the cliff and said, I'm done hunting. I quit. 
Yeah. The dynamic has definitely changed. Like, I don't think that was a fear back. Nobody was worried. Like, you had Pennsylvania more hunters than it had ever seen. Mm -hmm. So it's the the environment has definitely changed. That is something that, you know, per people we've talked to needs to be considered. And so it's it's a it's a new dynamic in that sense. Yeah. But I think that the it, it, again, it's a chicken and egg scenario where I would be in favor because we've seen it before. Pennsylvania could support more hunters. But the access thing is blocking that more than anything. Well, and that's a whole nother conversation. Around, and we could get in, you know, we will again in the future and maybe with Gary in the future is that I, we think that these increased technologies, we talked about it with Lee from Seek One is like they make the world smaller. And so fewer richer guys are conquering the white tail world. There you go. And it's because of these tools that all the other hunters want. It's, it's yep. propping that up. Yep. And so the more we can shine light on that. The it's more crazy. those things can be addressed, you know, aka restricted in some senses, and ultimately the hope is that that will, uh, you know, free a access up for people to continue to enjoy hunting, or may maybe even more people to. Enjoy I'm it. seeing it pretty clearly. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> crazy, uh, but awesome perspective. I, I mean, amazing, <laughs> amazing. So cool to have had conversations with my uncle. I know you and like with your family. Like the, so much of our history is yeah. rooted in things that Gary impacted directly a giant and to have man. him on a, a call a live, from live california there. is yeah i mean it, i remember i called my well we were in we were going to uh illinois for the first day of gun season yeah. and we're driving in the car my dad and i are just bullshitting because we're just left kansas you're like dad look who's calling me i did it, it was blowing up i said do you see who's calling me he's like is that gary alt i was like fuck gary alt <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah so pick up the phone yeah. and that's how it started and so really cool to to see that and Obviously appreciate Gary's time and, and uh, cool also to hear, you know, here it is 20 some years later that the Game Commission's given him a Lifetime Achievement Award. Absolutely. Freaking well earned. And look at him on the other side of it. Just, I mean, love and life, love and like life, loving hunting man. with his son. Like, oh. Dude's doing well. Glad well, to see that. that after was, all the death threats, after all the, the meetings. Yeah. I mean, some people would hate deer after all that. Yeah. You know, you think about what deer did to your life during those four or five years. Yeah. Um, and he, lo he still loves it. Yeah. On the I'll other tell side. you what though. I mean, you, you hear that and you, you do like Mike, obviously Rex is one, but like there aren't many guys who are in state positions that have that passion for deer hunting. Yeah. And that is also a concern of my moving forward. Yeah. Who's actually running these states deer departments and who's making decisions and do they relate to us? And sure. I don't say us as in like Jeremy. Oh, we don't Jeremy. know them necessarily. Like I'm sure there are guys public. out there. I mean, guys get on that path, but undoubtedly, you know. There's not Yeah, many. there's guys that don't care too, for sure. Or don't share the same viewpoint because they're not a hunter. Right. Oh, definitely. That's a, that's a big reality of what's happening in, in game agencies yeah. today. Yeah, definitely. So. Anyways, uh, we appreciate Dr. Gary Alt joining us. Uh, episode 163, Nick. 163. And... Uh, Awesome thing. Hope you had a great Christmas. If you're listening to this, I'm going to drop. And we'll catch you next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.